Hello, and welcome back again to our 12th lecture on pagans and Christians in antiquity. In this first portion of today's lecture, I would like to look at some of the implications in the generation or so after the death of the Emperor Julian the Apostate. For lack of a better term, it's really a question of what I call here a struggle over faith and culture. That is, with the end of this pagan Emperor Julian and his program to bring back the old gods, the question then was essentially reopened. Exactly what faith, what religion was going to take charge of the Roman world? Would the Christians be able to reestablish their position or would the pagans find a new leadership? Well, it very quickly became clear that the pagans were in no position to reestablish their leadership. They had no one to act as an alternate to Julian. Uh, and even if they did have a pagan emperor, they had no man who would have had the kind of vision Julian did of what it would take to reverse the Constantinian Revolution. The death of Julian was therefore a serious blow to paganism in the Roman world. On the other hand, the Christians didn't get the best emperors with the death of Julian. Uh, Jovian, the man who had been elected by the officers of the Eastern Army uh, inside the tent the night of Julian's demise, turned out to be a rather feckless ruler. He did get the army out of Persia and he did get them back to Roman territory, but at a very high price. He was found mysteriously dead in February of 364 and two senior army officers, the brothers Valentinian and Valens, were proclaimed co-emperors, joint emperors. Valens and Valentinian were emperors of a wholly different and uh, regrettably in inferior quality than the family of Constantine. Neither one of these emperors was really a man of first-rate ability, although they were respected by their officers and the army at the time. They had several problems. First, they were from Pannonia, which is essentially the region of Hungary today. Uh, that is, they were provincials. They were of what to the Roman aristocracy appeared barbarian origin. In some circular circles, it was actually circulated that their ancestors had only been Romans for at most a generation or two. Additionally, they were Aryan Christians at the time of their accession, that is, heretical Christians. But Valentinian uh, converted to Nicene Christianity rather quickly, and uh, he took over the western half of the Roman world. His brother Valens remained an Aryan, and he was the governor, the, I'm sorry, the emperor of the eastern half. And not only was he the younger brother, but he also was a lesser figure. He was the one who, as we learned yesterday, died at the Battle of Adrianople in 378. Um, but, but that's jumping to the end. Uh, the brothers were also seen to lack legitimacy because they weren't connected to the imperial family of Constantine. In effect, what they had to do was establish a second Christian dynasty of Rome. And it was really a question of exactly what they could achieve. First of all, they tried to cloak themselves in the symbol of, symbols of Constantine. Uh, coins, medallions, uh, public arts from this period show very much a return to the images of Constantine. The Labarum, the Cairo are all projected prominently. On the other hand, Valentinian and Valens, while they did get rid of some of the offending legislation of Julian, the law on education, for instance, was immediately rescinded. The imperial funding of the cults and the temples was likewise ended. But other than that sort of thing, they didn't move to outlaw the sacrifices or to ban the traditional pagan rites. In this, they had to take a moderate ground because the pagans had clearly regained ground under Julian's reign, even though it was only for a short time. Many officers and soldiers were still pagans, and it is clear that many of the provincial elites of the Roman world continued to be um, I'm sorry, many of the provincial cities of the Roman world continued to be in the hands of the pagan elite, that decurian class. Even in major cities such as Caesarea, which is today the modern city of Kaiseri in Turkey, or cities of kind of a second rank in the Roman provinces of North Africa or Spain, clearly were still held 
by the pagan decurions as powerful figures. And the, the bishops in those places had not yet asserted themselves against those pagan families. It was still, therefore, a very tentative situation, religiously speaking. Valens and Valentinian, out of sheer pragmatism, had to tolerate the existence of the pagan cults. And for the next generation after Julian's death down to really 391 slash 392, the pagans found themselves in a position that was somewhat analogous, ironically, uh, to uh, the Christians in the years before Constantine. That is, in a position that their parents or grandparents had been in. Christianity was still clearly the favored faith, but the old gods had not yet been, and, and, and the old gods had not yet been outlawed. Um, there were still many indications in certain parts of the Roman world that the traditional faith and religious rites went on, but it was also clear that the gods were not favored at the imperial court and that the city of Constantinople was very much a Christian capital. This led to a rather peculiar religious situation at the end of the fourth century. And in some ways, I think this ambiguous situation meant that the pagans were really caught off guard when in 391 slash 392, the emperor uh, Theodosius I dramatically outlawed uh, the cults and really moved against them. This would spark a really half-hearted revolt in Italy by the pagan senators. The second, um, uh, uh, the second thing is that the pagans were not really ready to face the new Christian shock troops, that is the ascetics and monks, who increasingly came to play an important role in the conversion of the Roman Empire at the end of the fourth century, and particularly in the fifth and sixth centuries. In the aftermath of Julian's death, that first generation after Julian, then the situation really is quite ambiguous. Furthermore, the two brothers, Valentinian and Valens, inherited leaders, uh, sorry, leadership over a Christian population still divided over the Trinitarian issue between Arians and Nicaeans. That too would change with Theodosius, who would come down decisively on the side of the Nicene Creed and would thus impose unity on the imperial sponsored church, and then he would ultimately move to outlaw the cults in 391, 392. Uh, but before we get there, we have to really explore the question, in what ways was the situation rather favorable to the pagans still in the aftermath of Julian's death, and in what ways was it not? Uh, and this can be measured in several ways. One would be just looking at the cities in the Roman world. When Julian issued his edicts and allowed the sacrifices to continue, many of the pagan elites in the cities of the Roman world, particularly uh, in North Africa and Italy and Spain, all hailed the return of the worship of the old gods. Archaeology is actually able to document that these shrines and temples continued to operate well throughout the fourth century and indeed into the fifth century. Some of them, even after those laws that I just mentioned of Theodosius, that would outlaw sacrifices to the gods in the early 390s. Um, in these cases, we know, for instance, that in the city of Aphrodisias, a city I've mentioned several times before, um, there is a villa, this is in Asia Minor, that's been excavated from the fourth and early fifth centuries, which we call the Villa of the Philosophers. And this villa was a major Neoplatonic school, a pagan Neoplatonic school of philosophy that flourished well into the fifth century AD. In excavations of this house, a set of tondos were found, which are on display in the museum. A tondo is a, a double bust, really, a, a, that is, a bust would be the, just a kind of top chest and head of a, of a person. This is one with another person stuck onto the back of it, kind of looking forwards and backwards. And they exist of Alcibiades and Socrates, Alexander the Great and Aristotle, stressing, of course, the kind of classical duality of men of action, men of philosophy. And uh, it's clearly one of the indices of the rich pagan philosophical tradition that was certainly continuing after Julian. At Athens, there is a whole resurgence of Neoplatonic thought, particularly with Proclus, one of the great Neoplatonic um, uh, thinkers of the fifth century at Alexandria. Uh, the great school continued to flourish. One of the most uh, controversial figures known to the popular mind is the mathematician Hypatia, 
who was killed in 14, I'm sorry, 414 AD, an event dramatized in a somewhat recent movie about 12 years ago named the Agora or Agora. Uh, far more significant were the philosophers who were writing in Athens and Alexandria, who continued to uh, articulate the views of Plotinus, who fostered the traditions of theurgy that go back into the third century AD and to Iamblichus, uh, that is the philosophical sort of justification for the rites. In some instances, these philosophers even evolved a doctrine that the learned philosopher can offer up sacrifices, knowing the intellectual meaning of these rites on behalf of the entire community. And this became a way of the, for the pagans of the fourth and fifth centuries intellectually coming to terms with the fact that the emperors and the imperial government no longer were sponsoring the sacrifices. But nonetheless, the learned pagan philosophers, whether they be in Alexandria or Athens or anywhere, could do so. And by thus revering the gods, they could win favor for the entire Roman world. And this is an idea that is transmitted through the literature of the late 4th and 5th and even into the 6th century AD. And it's an indication, I think, of how pagans are coming to terms with the fact that, yes, they may have lost the cultural leadership with Julian's death, but nonetheless, they still represent very important numbers. And indeed, we know there were still definitely very large numbers of pagans in the Roman world at this time. Inhabitants of the Roman Empire would still be pagans in large numbers well into the fifth century. And it's only in the fifth century that the balance of the population begins to really shift in favor of the Christians. So the pagans had all of this philosophical activity in the fourth century, but they also had an enormous amount of literary output. Uh, this includes histories such as Ammianus Marcellinus, who was without a doubt one of the most remarkable figures, uh, literary figures of late antiquity. His historical account starts in the reign of Trajan and ends at the Battle of Adrianople in 378, the death of Valens, one of those two fraternal emperors who followed shortly after Julian's death. We only have this latter portion of his history, but it is substantial. Um, we would like certainly to have had the earlier uh, stuff as well from the third century, and uh, especially from the third century, so it wouldn't be so dark to us uh, because of the nature of our sources. But the literary production of this period is characterized really by two different centers producing important outpourings of pagan literature that show that the pagan elites still saw themselves as the guardians of culture and the guardians of the traditional gods. Uh, the first of these cultural centers is the city of Rome itself. And then the second were the major kind of intellectual centers of the East. So the plurality of Athens, Alexandria, and Antioch. Those are the big ones in the East, the big pa pagan cultural centers that were still churning out tons of stuff at this time. Now, I'll be look, taking a look at all of these in turn. Let's take a look at the, at the West first. Uh, I mentioned in passing with a liter lecture on Constantine that once Constantine established Constantinople as the new Rome, the emperors essentially checked out of Rome. No one went back to the original city of Rome on the Tiber. It wasn't worth it. Strategically, it had been out of the picture since the mid-3rd century, and between 357 and probably 392, no single Roman emperor ever visited the city of Rome. They would be at Constantinople. Uh, they would be certainly also in the strategic capitals on the frontiers, such as Trier and Milan and uh, Antioch, but Rome itself was simply ignored. And as a result, the administration of the city of Rome and its environs fell to the hands of the great senatorial families, uh, pagans pretty much all. These were the families that could trace some of their descent back to the old aristocracy um, by bloodlines and connections to sometimes even to the Republic. And culturally, intellectually, religiously, they all um, were descendants of that Roman aristocracy that you know, went back to the, all the way to, back through the, throughout the mists of time to the early Republic, back to 509 BC. They postured as the guardians of Roman tradition. This was the kind of their intellectual pose. They never had abandoned the goddess Roma, that is, or the traditional gods of Rome, and they could just ignore those upstart emperors in Constantinople because they were left free to run Rome. 
Furthermore, they had been barred from imperial service, particularly army commands, ever since Diocletian. And as a result, the senatorial families, which amassed vast amounts of wealth, particularly landed wealth in Italy and Gaul, were all essentially left on their own to do as they wished. And that included holding the priesthoods, the old offices of the city of Rome, and certainly conducting pagan ceremonies and sacrifices. But uh, more for our purposes right now, engaging in literary production. We have a number of individuals we know from this late senatorial aristocracy who were great patrons, um, not just of the old pagan religion, but also of uh, the canons of classical literature. They, these were the men who carried out the editing of the works of Virgil and Cicero. Um, one of them was a fellow named Vettius Agorius Praetextatus, who in the fourth century, he and his wife epitomized this type of patronage that was expected from these senators. They would put on the vast festivals. They issued special medallions with pagan symbols. In fact, by one reckoning, by the middle of the fourth century AD, that is by the time of Valentinian and Valens, or let's say maybe even the, the final third qu uh, quarter of the fourth century, the 370s, this family alone could put on festivals stretching for weeks. By one calculation, two-thirds of the calendar year, uh, the city of Rome was engaged in pagan holidays. As we know, it had been, you know, since time immemorial, uh, when one reads, say, the Fasti of Ovid or something like that. By far, one of the illustrious uh, uh, men from this period was a man named Symmachus, who was one of the great leading senators. He dies in 402 AD, and he claimed descent from a number of important imperial families. He was essentially the leading pagan senator in Rome for the fourth century. Christian emperors had to pay attention to him. He was made urban prefect to administer the city of Rome. He was governor of Africa. He held a titular consulship. He alone could fund a remarkable circle of literati, that is the literate and educated classes who edited pagan texts, who carried out pagan festivals, who continued to venerate the old gods, all of this in defiance, certainly, of whatever laws were being promulgated by the Christian emperor in Constantinople. And actually, um, Symmachus and his comrades basically didn't even pay attention to the Roman emperor. It's a remarkable warning, I would say, in studying the careers of these senators, how difficult it is sometimes to date and, and chart religious change in the Roman world. So much of it depended on the effectiveness of Christian emperors and on the role of bishops in particular cities. And it's really very unevenly, um, um, unevenly uh, paced really within the Roman world. So in some places, if you have a powerful Christian family and or a powerful bishop who rose to prominence in a city and who enacted effective leadership like St. Basil the Great, who we, uh, as we documented yesterday, <clears throat> uh, he, you know, he, his, he and his family were so influential in the city of Caesarea, where he, he himself was bishop, and his family was so conspicuously influential. If you have somebody like that, then, yeah, they could turn the tide decisively in favor of Christianization within a generation. Um, and Another such dynamic bishop was a, a guy named um, Marcus Julius Eugenius, whom we learn about from a commemorative inscription from Laodicea. This is the modern day Kambusta of Turkey. And the inscription dates from earlier in the fourth century. Uh, and it simply says this, the Bishop of Laodicea and former soldier Eugenius commemorates the construction of a church after having suffered persecution and tortures under Maximinus Dia. You remember this was the uh, Caesar that was appointed by Galerius the, in the second tetrarchy. So um, his the Episcopal ministry of this man, uh, Eugenius, was uh, clearly very effective and it tipped the balance, we know, of the population in that city decisively toward Christianity. But on the other hand, if you are in a great city such as Rome, with a powerful Roman aristocracy, a pagan aristocracy who controlled half of the real estate of the Western Empire, and who took the reading and writing of the Latin classics as an act of piety, essentially, and who spent two-thirds of the year entertaining 250,000 citizens on the scale of festivals that even the emperor in Constantinople uh, couldn't do, then you could see how the city of Rome remained essentially a pagan city well into the fifth century. Uh, 
And it's only in the time of the pontificate of Leo I, who died in 461, that the Roman aristocracy in the middle of the fifth century finally came over, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in overwhelmingly to Christianity. But through the course of the second, century, second half of the fourth and fifth centuries, Rome remained largely a pagan center. There are, of course, uh, there was right there a large Christian community there, and there uh, certainly were large cathedrals there, not to mention an unbroken succession of bishops, but the senators simply ignored them, and the civil administration, the day-to-day -day running of Rome and Italy at large, still remained firmly in the hands of the great senatorial families who were nearly all pagans. Now, if you turn to various cities in the Roman East, you'd come basically up with the same picture. I mentioned the importance of the philosophical schools of Athens and Alexandria. Athens remained a pagan city probably well into the fifth century. Alexandria, on the other hand, was a city that was divided between pagans and Christians. And when Theodosius's ban on animal sacrifice came out in 391 slash 392, ending the cults, there were riots. There were demonstrations, there was violence, there was the destruction of the Serapium and the Museum, the Library of Alexandria, uh, which, as I just to repeat again, was dramatized in that movie from about 12 years ago, the Agora, Agora. And there in Alexandria, where the situation was far more evenly split, the Christians then, after that point, decisively take control by 392. But Athens continued to be a pagan city, as I said, as did many of the lesser cities of the Roman East. In addition to archaeology, such as what I mentioned a moment ago from the city of Aphrodisias, we also have in the late 4th and early 5th centuries, that is in the generation and a half after Julian's death, an outpouring of significant pagan literature in the Greek East, and to some degree in the Latin West too, which is essentially the final blossoming, the final blooming of pagan literature. As literature goes, most classicists don't even bother reading it. It's pretty tough stuff in some ways, it's pretty tough going. Uh, for one, it's generally written in a very florid and high blown style, particularly uh, the epic poetry that we're gonna mention in a moment. We have a number of epics that were actually written by Greek speakers in the Roman East. Uh, first to mention, there was a man named Nonus um, who wrote a epic on Dionysius, simply called the Dizia, Dionysiaca, uh, written by Nonus, who's uh, apparently writing in Egypt. And he tries to, what he does effectively is systematize all of the various myths and traditions about Dionysus, about having gone into the East and, you know, of course, being born, Semele and all that stuff. And he tries to pull it all together into one unified epic poem, of course, using the Greek dactylic hexameter. Um, one of the figures that, um, uh, that sort of sums up the whole literary tradition of the late 4th and early 5th centuries. There's a fellow named Quintus of Smyrna. Quintus of Smyrna, writing in Greek, has the distinction of writing the, the longest ep epic poem in antiquity in either Greek or Latin. It's well over 20,000 verses, which is longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. It is a very learned retelling of all the events that Homer didn't mention in those works. From earliest times, there had been other epic poems surrounding the events of the Trojan War. These are known as the epic cycle. And while they no longer exist, they were known in antiquity, and they form the basis for Quintus's epic. And although writing in the generation after Julian's death, the poem is composed entirely, again, in the Homeric tradition, that is, in the language and style of a thousand years earlier. Quintus was writing in the city of Smyrna, today the modern Turkish city of Izmir, uh, at the time, a very important city in Asia in which there was a bishop, but there was still this very large pagan population there. The epic is the epitome of the kind of learned style of late pagan authors, that is, a deliberately archaizing uh, kind of style, and it has an almost pious reverence for the epics and the traditions that go back to the earliest monuments of pagan Greek literature, namely Homer and Hesiod. As a work of literature, the poem itself is really only interesting to specialists today, but as I say, it does epitomize the type of literary production that one sees at this time in the late 4th and early 5th centuries. Uh, 
Its very composition at this time indicates that it was by no means assured, at least in the minds of these pagans, that they had lost the culture, even with the death of the Emperor Julian. And one could, uh, you know, go on and number various other poems and epics written by different Greek authors in the late 4th and 5th centuries that are like this, even also Latin authors such as Claudian, writing at this time, who wrote on many themes from classical mythology, but in Latin. There were also a production of a new brand of pagan history, historical writings. There were a number of writers that have come down to us, usually in fragments, but one that has survived intact was written by a man named Zosimus, who wrote a work that's often called the New History. Zosimus's history is rather peculiar in a number of ways. It's a continuous narrative in the Greek and Roman tradition, that is a linear view of time. It talks of emperors, it talks of battles, but Zosimus epitomizes this new kind of apologetic literature that the pagans now have begun to write. He argues, that is, through his presentation of history, that the reason that the Roman Empire was suffering military reverses on the frontier was because the emperors had abandoned the worship of the old gods. And this led to the collapse uh, ultimately, of the Western Empire in 476. And Zosimus went out of his way in his writing to criticize not only Christianity at large, but specifically the policies of Christian emperors and above all, Constantine. The negative appra appraisal of Constantine really uh, is given its first articulation in Zosimus. Constantine is criticized for his military policies as much as for his abandonment of the gods of Rome. Zosimus wrote in a vein of history that characterized a number of these Greek authors of the late 4th and 5th centuries, pagans, who were trying to use history as a way to appeal to the emperors and the Christian elites that return to the old gods will assure success, that they've always assured success, and that the reason why Rome came to, to rule the world was the fact that they had given their trust to the ancient gods of Rome. Pagan orators uh, operated very much in the same light. Two of the most significant orators from this time of the late fourth century are one Themistius, who was at Constantinople, and the other is named Libanius of Antioch. They both knew the emperor Julian. Libanius, you might recall from our lecture on Julian, was actually his teacher, uh, and even gave a, the funeral oration at Julian's funeral. They continued to operate under the emperors Valens and Valentinian, and even into the reign of the Emperor Theodosius. These orators who composed traditional panegyrics to the emperor and also trained students in rhetoric and the classes and, and the classics came up with new forms of oratory to appeal to Christian emperors for toleration. This was the first time that pagans ever made these kind of arguments, now in the late fourth century after the death of Julian, because up until this point, they never had had to make these kind of arguments. Theirs were significant works in which the pagan authors tried to make the kind of arguments, interestingly, ironically, that the Christians themselves had been forced to make in the second century. That is, that they were loyal Roman citizens, that they were worshipping in the traditions of their ancestors, um, that Christian emperors should tolerate them, uh, even if they were not going to worship the gods themselves, these intellectuals, orators, and philosophers would uh, do so on behalf of the community. It's really quite an ironic uh, inversion of the situation that we had in the period before the Emperor Constantine. And we have a number of these orations. I will just read you now an excerpt from one uh, from Libanius, who it must be stressed was really one of the foremost orators of his day and was a staunchly committed pagan. Okay, This excerpt is from a speech produced in 386 and which was addressed to the Emperor Theodosius, whom we will meet later today. The speech was prompted by a recent tour of inspection of the Eastern provinces by the Praetorian prefect, one Maternus Synegius, during which he destroyed a number of pagan temples with the assistance of a band of Christians. The focus of Libanius's invective in the following excerpt is against them. This is what Libanius says, just a small excerpt from the whole speech. You then have neither ordered, the, this is speaking to 
Theodosius. You then have neither ordered the closure of temples nor banned entrance to them. From the temples and altars you have banished neither fire nor incense nor the offerings of other perfumes. But this black-robed tribe, who eat more than elephants, and by the quantities of drink they consume, weary those that accompany their drinking with the singing of hymns, who hide these excesses under an artificially contrived pallor. These people, sir, while the law yet remains in force, hasten to attack the temples with sticks and stones and bars of iron, and in some cases disdaining these with hands and feet. Then utter destruction follows, with the stripping of, who, of roofs, demolition of walls, the tearing down of statues, and the overthrow of altars, and the priests must either keep quiet or die. After demolishing one, they scurry to another and to a third, and trophy is piled on trophy in contravention of the law. Such outrages occur in the cities, but there are most, they are most common in the countryside. Many are the foes who perpetuate the separate attacks, but after their countless crimes, this scattered rabble congregates and calls for a tally of their activities, and they are in disgrace unless they have committed foulest outrage. So they sweep across the countryside like rivers in space, and by ra ravaging the temples, they ravage the estates. For wherever they tear out a temple from an estate, that estate is blinded and lies murdered. Temples, sir, are the soul of the countryside. They mark the beginning of its settlements and have been passed down through many generations to the men of today. In them, the farming communities rest their hopes for husbands, wives, children, for their oxen and the soil they sow and plant. An estate that has suffered so has lost the inspiration of the peasantry together with their hopes. For they believe that their labor will be in vain once they are robbed of the gods who direct their labors to their due end. And if the land no longer enjoys the same care, neither can the, the yield match what it was before. And if this be the case, the peasant is the poorer and the revenue jeopardized. For whatever a man's willingness, surely his inability frustrates him. So the outrages committed by these hooligans against the estate bear upon vital matters of state. If the victims of this looting come to the pastor in the town, that is the bishop in Antioch, for that is the title they give to a fellow who is not all that he should be, if they come and tearfully recount their wrongs, this pastor commends the looters and sends the victims packing with the assurance that they are lucky to have got off so lightly. Yet, sir, these victims are your subjects too, and as workers are more useful than idlers, so are they more useful than their oppressors. Persuasion is required in such matters, not constraint. If persuasion fails and constraint is employed, nothing has been accomplished, though you think it has. It is said that in their own rules it does not appear, but that persuasion meets with approval and that compulsion is deplored. Then why these frantic attacks on the temples if you cannot persuade and must needs resort to force? In this way, you would obviously be breaking your own rules. A most interesting passage in so many ways because you can see the kinds of arguments that Libanius is using here, the appeal to tradition, the appeal to um, the uh, usefulness of, of the faith that he is defending, uh, the appeal indeed to um, the, what is called an, an, um, uh, what is called a, uh, an implicit critique or a, a, an imminent critique, I'm sorry, is the word I'm looking for. An imminent critique is when, a, when a, a, a debater will say, what you're doing contradicts your own values. And uh, all of these actually had been used against, uh, by the Christians against the pagans in the second century among the Christian apologists. And now with tremendous irony, um, and however improbably, the pagan orators had to be, have, have become, in some sense, apologists. Yet a rather different tack <clears throat> was taken by yet another staunch pagan author of the same time, one Eunapius, who in 405 wrote his work, Lives of Philosophers and Sophists, by sophists he means orators. Um, these were biographies of 23 older and contemporary philosophers and orators. Now, in spite of this work's bad style and its general superficiality, the book is our actually only real source for the history of the Neoplatonists of this age. And Eunapius also wrote a continuation of the universal history of, of an author named Dexippus, 
uh, whose work no longer survives. And um, a prominent feature of both of these works by Eunapius is a marked spirit of bitter hostility towards Christianity. He never really loses an opportunity, foregoes an opportunity to say something nasty about Christianity. Um, and, but if we look past that, what seems to have been his motivation for writing about these themes, particularly on the first subject, that is on the lives of Greek pagan philosophers and orators, what seems to be his main motivation for writing this is a cultural defense of the achievements of pagan intellectuals over against the obviously rising and encroaching influence of Christianity. In all of this, we get, um, oh, and I'll give you one more example of somebody who we're going to talk much more about later tonight. Um, that would be uh, that same Ansimachus who I referred to earlier on, uh, who was the uh, uh, prefect in Rome. Symmachus wrote a series of letters to the Christian emperors Gratian and Valentinian II about that old altar of victory that I've mentioned several times. This pagan altar in the Roman Senate house, which had been removed as offensive on orders of, of Gratian. It had been removed earlier than that by Constantius II, then put back by Julian and now removed again by Gratian. Uh, Symmachus argued, wrote letters saying that it should be restored because uh, it was proper worship for the gods. And what he did was write, as I say, this series of learned letters. We're going to read parts of them later. Uh, all of them were rejected. But the point I'm making at this moment is to say that what this shows is that the pagans were now forced to be on the defensive. They now had to make arguments to prove their case from history. And they made their appeals through letters and orations that the traditional worship should continue. But as I said, we will continue. We will examine this particular issue about the altar of victory in more detail later. If you put it all together, though, all of this literature and all of this intellectual activity is indicative of the mixed religious situation after Julian, where paganism is trying to reassert itself. And it is by no means certain to the pagans that Christianity will necessarily win. And it is also indicative, all of this intellectual and literary activity at this time, it is also indicative of one further point. Namely, that the pagans really never fully understood the nature of the religious conflict of this time and what was ultimately at stake. Now, Julian definitely did understand what was at stake. That is the entire uh, extermination of paganism from, from Europe. But Julian had been an apostate from Christianity. These pagan authors did not really understand what was at stake. Uh, namely the entire religious system that would control the destinies of the Roman world and eventually the whole cultural future of Western civilization. Even under the persecutions when there were pagan emperors, the idea was to get Christianity, Christians to conform and sacrifice to the gods. The pagans themselves never had a coherent concept of proselytizing, of trying to get people to convert. Uh, or even now in this flourishing of this kind of last flowering of pagan letters and, and intellectual uh, developments in the late fourth and early fifth centuries, even now they had no clear concept of opposing the, the Christian Roman emperors the way that the Christian martyrs had opposed the pagan ones. And most of the pagan resistance now came in the form of these various literary productions. It was not acts of martyrdom. It was not, you know, anything dramatic. It was orations and letters and almost passive resistance in what was becoming an increasingly Christian world. And this is something that's very curious to many of us studying religious change in the late Roman world. You have all this pagan literary production. You have all this clear archaeological evidence that many cults and oracles continue to function in the fourth and even into the fifth century. And that at select cities such as Athens and Rome, the traditional elites continued to control the public institutions and put on pagan festivals. And furthermore, that Christian Roman emperors were very hesitant to move against those cities until quite late in the fifth century. And the question is, why didn't the pagans mount a far more effective resistance in this generation after Julian? Why did they lose the battle over who would control the culture and faith of the Roman world? Part of it, part of the answer to that question is, I think, in the nature of the pagan religious outlook itself. Uh, the pagan leadership, the literary classes of the Roman world, were essentially a 
Mandarin elite. They were social conservatives. When a Roman emperor ruled against a pagan sanctuary at a particular place in a particular time, it would generate an oration. It would generate a letter. But most of these pagan elites were very wary of defying the Christian Roman emperor openly. That would invite civil war, and civil war could mean uh, revolution and, and social upheaval, social change, race, no why. And that's something, that's something that none of the pagan learned classes ever wanted. They were willing to put up, therefore, with a certain amount of legal disabilities. They were willing to put up with the fact that they no longer were in charge of the imperial government. But so long as they were allowed to practice their rights to continue their traditions with minimal interference from the imperial government, and so long as they could still have their kind of, you know, book clubs or whatever, um, then they would not rock the boat. They never had any kind of coherent sense of how they could win the emperor back to the old gods, and, or even how they could challenge the Christian emperor. And so from the start, with Julian's death, the pagans really lacked both the leadership and vision to mount another effort so as to bring back the old faith. They had, in effect, in the words of the scholar Ramsey McMullen, been taught to be passive and quiet. And that's perhaps the most significant development, culturally and intellectually, for the pagans after the death of Julian. Now, uh, we will just read this from A.D. Lee. Although their resolve was weakening, there remained a substantial body of senators who were committed to paganism, as attested by a number of inscriptions. In particular, two inscriptions, dating from 376 and 378 AD respectively, illustrate a distinctive feature of this body of inscriptions compared with earlier periods, namely the multiple priesthoods and initiations in a wide range of cults of Roman, Greek, and Near Eastern origin. This distinctive feature has been seen as reflecting the determination of these pagan senators to stand for the potential unity of the old religion now that the emperor was a Christian. Let's just read these inscriptions now. To the great gods, to the mother of the gods, Sibylle, and to Attis, Sextilius, Agesilaus, Idesius, a man of senatorial rank, a not undistinguished legal advocate in the African courts and in the imperial council, also Magister Libellorum et Cognitionum Sacrarum, Magister Epistularum, Magister Memoriae, all senior legal posts at the imperial court. Deputy of the Praetorian Prefects in the Spanish provinces with responsibility for imperial appeals, father of fathers of the invincible sun god Mithras, priest of Hecate, chief priest of the god Liber, that is Bacchus, dedicated this altar after being reborn into eternity through the sacrifice of a bull, remember the Torah bolium, and the sacrifice of a ram, when our Lord Valens was consul for the fifth time, and our Lord the younger Valentinian, the second for the first on the Ides of August. So you see this tremendous kind of pulling together, this eclecticism of all these various cults, east, west, you see a little bit of the mystery cults kind of getting in there, you know, they're being reborn unto eternity and all this stuff. Uh, this you know, paganism is still going great guns at this point among this, this small, this increasingly uh, circumscribed, smaller senatorial elite. Another um, inscription of the same nature. To the eternal shades, Vedius Praetextatus was augur, priest of Vesta, priest of the sun, member of the board of 15, curial priest of Hercules, consecrated to Liber and in the Eleusinian Mysteries, priest of Hecate, temple warden of Serapis, Serapis, initiated with bull's blood, there's the Torabolium again, father of fathers. In political affairs, he was imperial candidate for Quaestor, urban praetor, governor of Tuscia and Umbria in Italy, governor of Lusitania in Spain, governor of Ikea, um, uh, I'm sorry, Ikea in Greece, um, uh, Prefect of the city of Rome, an envoy sent by the Senate on five occasions, Praetorian Prefect of Italy and Illyricum, twice Consul Designate for 385, also Laconia Fabia Paulina, a lady of senatorial rank, consecrated to Ceres and in the Eleusinian Mysteries, consecrated to Egina, to, at Egina, which is an island outside of Athens, to Hecate, initiated with bull's blood, priestess of Hecate, these two lived together in unity for 40 years. Oh boy, so you got, it's, it's actually like a uh, kind of like a anniversary thing, but notice again, all of this 
these th these are the kind of decurian classes that we're talking about. These are the senatorial classes. These were the the political elites, the political class that are obviously still heavily heavily active in paganism. Now, again, if you pull it all together, the result is that this peculiar situation resulted in many pagans, particularly of the upper classes, eventually. When they did convert, they would they ultimately of crossing over to Christianity. And to the degree that there was any bridge at all, I think that the arguments that Platonism was a bridge to Christianity and that the appropriation of classical letters and of classical visual arts, as we've learned about in the last couple of lectures, these formed a way of moving pagans away from their ancestral faith to Christianity. Those arguments do really gain force when you look at the situation in the fourth century. One of the best examples of this sort of thing, of the literate and more socially you know, conservative members of society uh, converting to Christianity over this time period, is with a fellow named Synesius of Cyrene. He was a Neoplatonist from the city of Cyrene, which is Libya. He was born in 373 and died in 414. And there's very good evidence to believe, in fact, there's a definitive biography of him by Jay Bregman, if you want to look into it, uh, who, uh, Jay Bregman is one of the really, the few people who can really understand Neoplatonism. <laughs> it's a very complicated kind of philosophy. And, um, and he clearly shows that Synesius was in many ways a classic Neoplatonic philosopher, but he ended his career being ordained Christian bishop of his home city as representing his city vis-a-vis -vis the imperial government and even advising the government of Arcadius, that was one of the sons of Theodosius I. And what Synesius represents is a pagan philosopher who was able through his Platonism to walk a bridge to Christianity, to reconcile in his mind that Christianity and especially institutional Orthodox Christianity of the imperial sponsored church in its language, in its visual arts, in its literature, had made consonant so consonant so much of the of of the best of the Greco-Roman classics that he could essentially believe the argument going back to Clement of Alexandria that the true philosopher was a Christian, and he could therefore cross that bridge. He didn't have to sacrifice uh, the best of Greco-Roman culture, but could ultimately move from being a pagan philosopher to being a Christian bishop with complete ease. And the same crossing over would be achieved by many of these senatorial families in the course of the late 4th and into the 5th century AD uh, in the Roman West. Their Stoic philosophy was perhaps more common than their Platonic, but certainly in the course of the 5th century, they would cross that bridge to Christianity. So that by the middle of the 5th century AD, the intellectual and cultural leadership of the Roman world had decisively become Christian. And with that, Christianity was now the faith of the elite classes and would dictate the subsequent course of Western civilization. I now want to change our focus right now for a moment to examine one of the most interesting and important consequences um, of the conversion of Constantine to Christianity, namely the emergence of a new emphasis on asceticism within Christianity and the emergence of holy men who embody the ascetic ideal. Uh, we're also going to, by virtue of looking into this question, examine how Christian theologians during the fourth and fifth centuries developed increasingly sophisticated and to contemporaries persuasive arguments on behalf of the notion that celibacy and virginity were the ideal states for human beings. During the pre-Constantinian period, when Christianity was uh, in the immediate uh, time before his conversion, uh, was an illegal religion, and in the period before that, prosecuted, uh, persecuted at various uh, times and in uh, uh, sundry uh, levels of uh, of duration. Christianity's religious elite consisted of the confessors and martyrs. Confessors, as we've said before, were individuals who openly professed their Christianity to Roman officials in the uh, knowledge that they would be uh, 
perhaps martyred for making this open statement of their beliefs, and they suffered for that. They weren't killed, but they suffered. Martyrs were those who actually were killed after confessing their Christianity. Christians who were looking um, uh, at these people saw them as kind of the highest spiritual ideal, those who uh, had been tested, who had suffered, who had become confessors, and even indeed uh, had sealed with their own blood their testimony of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. To accept martyrdom was to imitate the Lord as perfectly as a human being could. It was to submit oneself to Roman authorities just as the Lord had been uh, subjected to the Roman authorities and been crucified. It was to accept one's own death willingly, just as Christ, Christ had, had accepted death in order to atone for the sins of humanity. Indeed, the act of confessing one's belief in the expectation of martyrdom was seen as so spiritually meritorious that it was in some sense regarded as a second baptism. It wiped clean all of the sins that one had committed up to that point in time. Now, of course, martyrdom was not for everyone. Um, not everyone could do that. Um, it required, of course, tremendous courage, but of course, a gift from God, ultimately. Um, and it wasn't given to everyone. And because we have in our own uh, possession a number of trial transcripts, actual records that were written down uh, of the martyrs as they were examined by Roman officials, and we read some of those, if you remember. These transcripts often reveal how hard it was to get, uh, you know, to, uh, in a sense, to to, uh, to go through with the, the, the very difficult act of giving one's own life up for Christ. Martyrs often had to undergo two or three successive trials before they could actually be executed. And this sort of level of commitment, this sort of, uh, tremendous uh, love for God that would that one was willing to uh, seal with one's own blood. Once the prosecution persecutions had ended, um, the, with the conversion of Constantine, the situation changed dramatically. It had been um, now Christianity, whereas before you could have been you know killed for simply professing belief in Christ, now Christianity was becoming not the official religion of the Roman Empire yet, although it would get there by the end of the third century, the fourth century. But now it was just the opposite. Now professing Christianity actually got you social advancement, got you um, the ability you know to be preferred in uh, in in the bureaucracy of the imperial government. and um, Therefore, the conversion of Constantine resulted in an influx of many, we might say, opportunistic converts to Christianity, as people saw the writing on the wall and became Christian because of job advancement to make their own lives easier, just the opposite, really, of what the profession of Christianity beforehand had always been. Um, and therefore, to the older Christians, to those who had weathered the persecutions of Diocletian, for example, um, they saw that Christianity seemed to be being watered down, as it were. It was becoming, um, it was becoming kind of more worldly, and among not, of course, the faith itself, but by by so many of these new adherents. In this confluence, this kind of conflict, we might even say, uh, was going to lead and did lead more and more individuals to follow the example of Saint Anthony of Egypt, who, of course. You know about from the book that you have just read for this past week, uh, St. Anthony, born around 250 and uh, died over 100 years later in 355. Um, uh, Anthony began to pioneer the deserts of Egypt uh, with a new type of Christian heroism that was going to resonate powerfully with those who were seeking the true fervor of the faith. Um, that had existed in the pre-Constantinian world. Antony was orphaned at a relatively young age and he lost both of his parents in his late teens. And shortly after the death of both of his parents, he was going through a period of searching in life and he was in church and heard the gospel text um, in which Christ stated that all those who wish to be perfect should sell all that they possessed, give it to the poor and come and follow after him. Uh, 
Antony decided that he was going to follow this command quite literally, and he sold everything he possessed and decided to follow the Lord Jesus Christ uh, by going to retreat into the deserts of Egypt to abandon civilization. And there he lived for a while and decided that this lifestyle in the desert was not even then sufficiently tough. Uh, Anthony went further uh, into the desert and resigned himself to the notion that he was going to have to kind of carve out a new sort of life for himself in the deserts of Egypt. Anthony attracted followers, uh, which was the last thing that he wanted to do because he wished to live as a hermit. But Egyptians who had heard about Anthony and his life in the desert came to admire him and they travel out into the desert to live near him. Whenever they approached, he would move farther out into the desert and try and lose them, but they were persistent and eventually he reconciled himself to the notion that they were going to be, there were going to be others living nearby. Well, as, as for the type of life that Antony was leading in the deserts of Egypt that was inspiring people to come and follow him, it was a life of rigorous asceticism that consisted of long and punishing fasts in which he would not eat for days on end, and in which he tried to reduce his consumption of food to the bare minimum necessary for human survival. It was a life characterized by long vigils at night in the cold of the desert and depriving himself of sleep as much as possible. And it was a life of total sexual abstinence and uh, poverty. In fact, his self-deprivation, his mortification of his own flesh gave him uh, the opportunity to receive such grace from God uh, that was that he was uh, that he confronted even the demons themselves, as we are, as we read about in the life of Saint Anthony, written by Saint Athanasius, uh, and and would triumph over these spiritual wickedness, the spiritual wickedness in high places. His contemporaries in Egypt referred to Anthony and to his followers as a monachos, the one alone. Uh, that is the literal translation, but of course it is where we get the word monk from. Although Antony came to personify the ascetic ideal, the life in which one did not eat more than they had to, slept very little, in which one abstained from all kinds of pleasures, um, although, he, although contemporaries called him monachos, he was not exactly uh, alone because he always, even though he wanted to be a hermit he always did have other people living somewhat nearby coming to see him and so on some of those who followed anthony and admired him d developed a more recognizably monastic form of life um recognizable by the later ages in which those who lived in ascetic life lived in a community and encouraged one another uh, and the individual who was responsible for gathering followers of anthony into a community was also an Egyptian by the name of Pacomius, who died in 346. Pacomius and those who lived with Pacomius engaged in collective activities together. They would gather several times a day to pray and then retreat to individual caves for their own devotions. And Pacomius became the leader of these individuals. He maintained discipline among them, and the followers accepted his judgments. Pacomius himself regarded the collective lifestyle in which ascetics would gather for prayer several times a day and then retreat to their own caves as merely a preparatory stage. It was a training ground or boot camp for the ultimate challenge, which was to follow Antony into the desert and to live by oneself. Um, but some of Pacomius' followers regarded the collective life in the desert as sufficiently challenging as an end in and of itself rather than as a means to an end. And so communal living became relatively commonplace among the ascetics of Egypt during the fourth century. During the course of that century, the individual elements of what would later be regarded as monasticism fell into place. Uh, one saw, for example, the building of individual houses for all of the monks to live in together, rather than simply gathering from various parts and at certain times of the day. You, one begins to see the term abbot or abba, father, applied to the head of the monastery as the abbot assumed a responsibility for supervising the various monks. And one saw, perhaps most importantly, the emergence of written rules, guidelines by which the monks were expected to abide. We saw this uh, yesterday, in fact, when the bishop in Cappadocia, the eastern, one of the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire named St. Basil of Caesarea, who died in 379, he composed probably the first written rule for monks. And the rule for living according to this rule 
in Latin, it's regula. Uh, this became sort of the defining characteristic of the medieval monk, at least in the East. In fact, monks were sometimes referred to as regular clergy, coming from this idea, this word for regula, or in living by a rule. And this differentiated them from the married clergy, uh, those priests who lived in the world, or even bishops who were not married, but who also lived in the world and did not have to live according to specific written rules. Monasticism was only one of the religious movements to emerge in Egypt uh, or in Syria during the fourth and fifth centuries, and even six centuries. The conversion of Constantine and the fact that martyrdom was not readily available anymore resulted in a remarkable period of religious, we might say, experimentation as people tried to find new forms of Christian heroicism. And although monasticism would eventually become the most widespread and the most popular, uh, it is important to note that there were some other experiments that were conducted in this part of the world at this time. For instance, there was what was known as the grazer movement. The grazers were holy men who lived by eating only grass and shoots, and sometimes went so far as to chain themselves up like barnyard animals, and in a sense attempted to rid themselves of their own kind of human, um, you know, the limitations placed, placed upon them by their humanity. There was something that uh, would continue time uh, off and on throughout the history of Christianity, uh, known as the Holy Fool Movement, which was popular in the 5th and 6th centuries, especially in Syria. The Holy Fools were late antique ascetics who defied social conventions and who behaved absurdly on purpose, who uh, pretended to be insane, um, so as to totally free themselves of the, hum the built-in human desire to live in a way so as to make oneself pleasant to other people, to always be looking for the approval of other people. In some ways, this is the most difficult thing for a human being to do. Think of your own selves. Think of our own lives. How much effort we put in in our day-to-day -day lives to making ourselves not look stupid and making ourselves look smart and attractive and pleasant to be around and funny and you know important and all of those things that we devote ourselves to all of those vanities that mean absolutely nothing uh these holy fools and as i said it is a movement it is a type of asceticism that um although it, it came into existence at this time would last all throughout christian history uh there are even some holy fools alive to this day um people who pretend, as I said, to be crazy or pretend to be strange, uh, uh, although this may not um, seem to be a particularly uh, uh, strange thing to do nowadays, given so much of our, um, how much of our culture has changed. But one of the things they would do is to parade around in, in the clothing of the opposite gender, uh, uh, to, um, to go into uh, women's uh, bathhouses and disrobe and, and jump into the water at which point they would be screamed at and, and, and uh, you know, the women would, would be horrified and, and call for a guard and have them beaten up and thrown out. Um, but the purpose of this, though, was to rid oneself of all of those props of our human experience so that everybody basically abandons you and you only are with God. Imagine just for a second what that would be like, to not care really not care what other people think of you. You've heard many people say that throughout your life, I'm sure. Oh, I don't care what anyone thinks about me. It's not true. We all care so much that we're willing to bend over backwards to try to make ourselves uh, pleasant to people we don't even know. How many times do we seek vaingloriously to strike just the right appearance or just the right pose on a train or you know, at a restaurant when we see somebody might be noticing us or whatever the case may be. Imagine totally being free of that. Well, that was the Holy Fool movement. Even more radically in some ways was the, what was known as the stylite movement. Stylites were individuals who lived up on the top of styli or poles. And stylites were especially popular in the fifth and sixth centuries in Syria. The founder of the stylite movement was Simeon the stylite who died in 459 and who is said to have lived on top of a 50-foot pillar for 40 years. His followers would bring him food via a ladder, and he would bring the food up to himself. Um, and uh, 
he would lower the ladder periodically and as if he was living on top of uh, as if living on top of a pillar exposed to the elements year round were not sufficiently harsh he would also perform painful physical exercises while on top of the pole uh, doing bows before God and uh, prostrations even on the top of his pole, sometimes even over a thousand of them in a single, at a single go. Uh, he had many admirers. There's a beautiful poem written about him by Lord Tennyson. If you would like to read it, just type it in. People would come to gather and look at Simeon in the stylite on top of his pole. And according to one contemporary biographer, the crowds gathered to worship the worms as they dropped from his body. Well, the Stylite movement, the Grazer movement, the Holy Fool movement, all, as I said, remain kind of small or fringe movements for the most part. Few were able to bring themselves to imitate these rather exotic forms of religious life, and they never caught on uh, widely. Although, as, as, as I do stress, you, sometimes you'll read it, if you read books about this sort of thing, they'll say that it never really took on afterwards. But it, it, the Holy Fool movement became uh, was something of a, of a tendency throughout Russian history in particular. In fact, that big, beautiful church that everybody always associates with Moscow, with all of the beautiful domes and everything, it is, it is St. Basil's Church, but it is not named after St. Basil of Cappadocia. Uh, it is named after St. Basil the Holy Fool, okay, who was a medieval Russian saint who practiced the same kind of uh, life of making sounds like a cat and, and uh, you know, having every, every time people were around, he would pretend to be totally crazy so that everybody, you know, shunned him. But this was all an act, so he could totally be free of that ego and draw closer to God. Well, <sighs> monasticism, though, did spread you know, as a wide movement to the western half of the Roman Empire very quickly. Already during the fourth century, one started to see the emergence of monastic communities in the West, and the main force that drove the spread of monasticism was a book written by the bishop, uh, St. Athanasius who you know all about. St. Athanasius, of course, of Egypt, of Alexandria, was familiar with Antony, and he wrote his life of St. Anthony, which quickly became very popular throughout the whole of the Roman Empire, and informed people about what was going on in Egypt. Athanasius invented with this book a wholly new literary genre, the hagiography, the lives of the saints, which supplanted the acts of the martyrs as the most popular form of Christian literature thereafter. Individuals enjoyed, loved reading about the saints and the types of lives they were leading. By the end of the fourth century, monastic communities were not at all rare in Western Europe. And you also started to see the writing down of monastic rules in the West, the earliest of which was composed around 420 by an individual named St. John Cassian, who had, um, although a Westerner, a Latin, he had spent time in Egypt living there as a monk, and he brought back some of his experiences to the West and put them into his own monastic rules. During the 5th and 6th centuries, monasticism would make even more headway in the West, and the most important monastic rule for the Middle Ages was composed in the first half of the 6th century by St. Benedict of Nursia, and a sign of the increasing prestige of monasticism in the West was the election of the first monk as Bishop of Rome, that is, St. Gregory the Great, Gregory I, Pope of Rome from 4, 590 to 604, and he maintained a monastic lifestyle even after his election as Pope, uh, which helped to popularize monasticism in this way. Although monasticism traveled from east to west, it changed in the process of that journey. And Western monasticism in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries was in some ways rather different than the monasticism of Pacomius in the deserts of Egypt. Western monasteries tended to be rather small establishments. You might have had a dozen or two monks living in one or uh, one place, as opposed to the hundreds of monks that one would have seen in large Egyptian monasteries. Uh, and indeed, some of the large monasteries in Russia and Mount Athos and Greece uh, in the Orthodox world still have hundreds of them, uh, hundreds of monks living in single places. These Western monasteries were often located in towns, oddly enough, rather than in the woods, uh, for example. And this was indeed contrary to the spirit of Egyptian monasticism, where the goal was to get away from people as much as possible. Many of the Western monasteries were frankly um, not as strict, not as ascetic when compared to the Egyptian monasteries, in that individuals who were living in these monasteries uh, would not 
absorb entirely the ascetic ideal. Um, what often happened was that an elderly individual, usually a man, but perhaps a wife who had lost a spouse, decided to convert his or her house into a monastery towards the end of his or her life and would gather together some elderly friends who were in a similar situation and they would join together and live according to a rule often one of their own devising and since it was of their own devising it was not often terribly strict so in a sense western monasteries in the early years in the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries functioned as almost kind of christian retirement communities where older individuals could gather together and practice religious devotion and enjoy one another's companionship. One could also find in these monasteries not only many elderly people, but also a lot of young people as well, because the practice of giving young children whom one could not support to monasteries uh, as kind of orphanages caught on in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries. These young children were known as obletes, and when one gave a child to a monastery, and entrusted it to the monks to take care of the child, theoretically the child was supposed to remain in the monastery for the rest of his or her life. Upon obtaining the age of reason, one might say around seven, you might have been invited to leave if you so choose, but it would have taken a tremendous amount of courage if all one had known was that monastery to go out and try to live on one's own. And because these obletes quite often found themselves placed in a monastery without being asked about it, their sense of vocation was not always very strong. And therefore, they too did not practice asceticism in the way that, say, an Antony would have approved, it, approved of it. Lay people, laiki is the Latin word, were willing to support these monasteries in part because they served important societal functions. They were places that would take care of the very young and the very old, but also because if they were not as rigor rigorously ascetic as one might have liked, nonetheless, the holy lifestyle of the monks within them gave them a special relationship to God, a, a better relationship than one uh, that uh, than the one that you that we might have enjoy, we might enjoy in the world, and therefore the the prayers of the monks were going to be more efficacious than one's own prayers, and so one was willing to endow monasteries with gifts of money of land in the hope that the monks would pray on their behalf. The Christian emphasis on asceticism and especially on celibacy as the best estate for humans um, was not wholly without classical or pagan precedent, but almost that, almost wholly without any precedent. Asceticism, uh, you could find the occasional pagan philosopher who maybe would argue that the best estate for human beings was to be celibate. Um, as I said, there were some very, very uh, rare inst religious institutions such as the Vestal Virgins or some other places uh, in which there were uh, um, you know, women who, who would be uh, virgins throughout their lives. Um, but for the most part, though, paganism had no sense whatsoever uh, of, of anything like uh, lifelong virginity. And that, and certainly not the idea that that would somehow be the best state for a human being. For Roman philosophers, even, the, for the average Roman in the street, abstinence seemed to be a rather threatening thing. It seemed rather threatening to the whole Roman social order, to the very existence of civilization, because everything around you, the towns and the cities and the people, all of that only had come into existence because people had gotten together and had babies um, and had done that for thousands of generations. So um, the whole idea of civic mindedness, uh, which was so big in the Roman imagination, all depended upon the family and, uh, and upon procreation. And so the very idea of having large swaths of the population forsake marriage and to live in a chaste celibate life, that all seemed, I think, really quite revolutionary to the pagan mind. Now, we don't have to get into all the theological details of this, but since the early decades of, Christian, of Christianity, a lively debate had essentially taken place among Christian thinkers about the place of celibacy, marriage, and so on within the Christian life. If one reads the letters of St. Paul in the Bible, especially to the Corinthians, you will see how some of these debates played out. Uh, St. Paul very clearly says, I would that all men were like me, meaning unmarried, but it is better to marry than to burn, is what he says. Um, the spread of asceticism from Egypt to the West in the fourth century, though, 
gave new urgency to the arguments for celibacy uh, because more and more people were starting to embrace the ascetic ideal. Um, you can even find some fourth century Christian authors, one thinks of Jovinian, for example, who maintain, is a, a heretical uh, Christian author, that he maintained that the celibate Christian found no special favor with God and that all baptized Christians are spiritually equal. Uh, there was no need for anyone to strive to maintain a state of perpetual virginity. Why would God approve of that? But against Jovinian and those who thought like him, such formidable Christian theologians as St. Ambrose of, of Milan or St. Uh, Jerome, who you see in front of you, uh, and especially St. Augustine himself, developed very sophisticated arguments in defense of abstinence and asceticism and virginity more generally. Ambrose of Milan, for instance, um, uh, says that Christians must have chased individuals as their leaders, that it would be necessary eventually for priests and certainly bishops to be chaste, and ideally they should not be married at all. Uh, Jerome shocked contemporaries, including a large number of Christian contemporaries, when he suggested that first marriages were acceptable if only regrettable capitulations to human needs, but second marriages were only slightly better than traveling to one's local brothel. As for why virginity and chastity were spiritually meritorious, St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, all agreed on the notion that asceticism made human beings more like the angels. Angels, of course, are incorporeal beings, bodiless beings. They do not experience the bodily drives to eat, to sleep, to procreate that humans do, and therefore they are closer to God than any human being is. If one were able to tame or subdue or even eliminate these passions from oneself, then one's life can approximate the angels and draw oneself ever closer to God. Another argument in favor of the ascetic ideal centered on Adam and Eve. Adam had not been battered down by what we might call primal drives. He didn't need to eat. He didn't need to procreate. He had led a life of uncorrupted tranquility. If human beings wanted to get back and experience life as Adam had experienced it in paradise, then they too needed to rid themselves of these drives that had been introduced only after original sin. Of all the early church fathers, however, none would be more influential on this topic, as on so many others, than St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, who died in 430, and who we will spend two whole lectures on uh, in, the, in the coming, uh, in, in next week. Augustine was something somewhat more moderate, actually, than Jerome on this issue, as on so many others, although we often regard Augustine as having been a very stern individual. Uh, in this context, he really took the middle road and um, reacted against extremes to either side. Augustine chastens celibates, saying that they should not look down upon the married, uh, they should not scorn the marriage estate, uh, and he debated Jerome and Ambrose concerning the whole issue of whether intercourse or, uh, had a, had a, and marriage had existed in paradise. Um, Jerome and Ambrose had shared the assumption that it was unknown in paradise, and perhaps even marriage itself too would not even have existed, but that like death, like physical pain, it had come into the world as a result of original sin. Augustine felt that was going too strong, and that actually uh, one could make an argument for the fact that it might have existed uh, within the paradisical state, if even without the fall, it's just that it would have been without passion. It would have been uh, kind of like something approaching like, you know, how flowers and uh, can you kind of fertilize one another, you know, uh, you know, exist on a kind of, you know, way that is totally without any kind of passion. Um, well, according, uh, we, again, we don't have to go into that. If, if, if you would like to look into more of what Augustine thought about that, I, that uh, you can read book 14 of the City of God. We will, um, we will not be going over that portion of it together in our, in our discussion. Though. But just to suffice it to kind of sum up here, during the 4th and 5th centuries, some individuals who pursued the ascetic ideal began to gather into communities of monks living under the supervision of an abbot. At the same time, church fathers such as Jerome and Ambrose and Augustine developed arguments concerning the superiority of celibacy to marriage. Arguments that would resonate well past the end of the Middle Ages. Um, we have certainly 
I, I have no uh, illusions, though, about the idea that we have just even begun to introduce the profundity and the originality of Augustinian thought. And so, as I said, the next two lectures are going to be all about him. But I kind of I don't even want to go there any further right now. What I'd like to do for the remainder of our time together, actually, is to look now to the end of the uh, fourth century, and that is to turn to Theodosius the first. We will begin by dealing with really what is the crucial turning point in the entire development of Christianity in the Roman world. And that is really with the, the I'm sorry, we will end here now with the crucial turning point of this whole issue of religious change that we've been exploring this semester. And that is the career of the emperor Theodosius I, also known as Theodosius the Great, Saint Theodosius the Great. And I'll just begin with an anecdote. In 391, shortly after the emperor had passed laws that had outlawed animal sacrifice, and therefore pagan worship in general. The patriarch of Alexandria, Theophilus, released um, his, uh, I, I hesitate to, term, to use the term monks because they were really just kind of ruffians in black clothes, to attack pagans who had occupied the Serapium and Museum. If one recalls this event that I've talked about before, the Serapium was a temple of Serapis in Alexandria, it was also the center of an important library and lecture halls. The Museum or Museum was really more of an ac academy of arts and sciences uh, than what we think of as a museum. It had been founded all, all the way back in the third century BC by King Ptolemy. And these, these individuals, Christians, attacked the pagans. And the argument was that the pagans were secretly worshiping in underground sanctuaries. And this was in violation of the laws that had recently been passed by the emperor Theodosius. Pagans objected. They occupied both the Serapium and the Muzion to protect themselves. And the Christians, in a large mob, really a rabble, um, stormed into these buildings, smashed the, the pagan statues, destroyed papyrus rolls, and the fighting then spread out across the city of Alexandria. The imperial army did nothing. The population was maddened over the issue, and they broke in, and the cult statues were carted off and melted down. Uh, they were turned into cookery or they were turned into liturgical objects, even for the use by Christians. Cult statues such as uh, those of Priapus or uh, you know, other gods were paraded around and cast into the streets uh, as disgusting idols that the Christians would have nothing to do with. They were broken up. And the result of this attack on both the Serapian and the Muzion was that pagan Alexandria, classical Alexandria, essentially was destroyed and Christian Alexandria emerged. Now, scholars and popular writers have viewed this destruction as a turning point, and there's a good reason to do so. For one, the pagans who witnessed this destruction were absolutely intimidated. There are reports of conversions on the spot. The Christian mob had destroyed these cult statues, and nothing had happened. In addition, the entire action, while it wasn't ordered by the imperial government, certainly the Emperor Theodosius I approved. And indeed, this, this event was the climax to a series of legislative uh, acts issued by Theodosius, who had come to the throne in 379, which would forever ban pagan sacrifice and also impose unity within the imperial-sponsored church. It's very important to keep this in mind, because remember that in two, uh, at a previous time, I guess it was uh, two lectures back, I discussed how in 363, when the Emperor Julian died, the Christians regained the control of the emperorship, but the situation was by no means clear. It could be argued that in 363, the Christians could still um, be surmounted and that paganism could still emerge as the main religion of the Roman Empire. I began my whole lecture tonight kind of making that case, uh, that, the, that the pagans could still have lo looked at the situation under those lines. Well, the Emperor Jovian turned out to be, as I said, a feckless ruler. He was probably assassinated by his own officers on his return towards Constantinople. And he never made it there. Found mysteriously dead in his tent. And the Eastern army essentially settled the succession issue and declared two brothers, Valentinian and Valens, as emperors. And these were tough Balkan soldiers who apparently were Aryan in their belief system, but were popular with the army. And above all, there was an Eastern army that was still that still included in it a number of Christian officers and men, an army devoted to the house of Constantine and not particularly favorable to Julian. 
It was really a question of whether there would be another civil war then between an Eastern army and a Western army, which was still largely pagan, which included many recruits from the, Christ from the German barbarians from across the Rhine and was very much committed to the memory of the Emperor Julian, who had won their favor back in the mid 350s, you remember, um, when he was in Gaul. So as a result, these two brother emperors, Valentinian and Valens, established essentially the second Christian dynasty of the Roman world. Uh, but they were in a very uncertain position. And I mentioned uh, previously that this allowed the pagans to continue their worship. There's a lot of evidence from archaeology that many shrines were reopened under Julian and continued to function in the later fourth century. And again, some of them would continue, particularly the more remote ones or sanctuaries or oracles that were in secondary cities. That one example that I always come back to, Isonus in Western Turkey was the Temple of Zeus. And it had acquired uh, membership in the Panhellenion, that uh, magnificent Hadriatic temple operated into the fifth century. And apparently it was only toppled by an earthquake and was never converted into a church. And you have all these instances of temples operating well into the fifth century and even into the sixth century. Furthermore, I noted that there was an outpouring of pagan literature at the end of the fourth century and the beginning of the fifth century. But from the start, these two Christian emperors, Valens and Valentinian, were the real successors to Julian. Jovian, as I say, was more of a hiccup than anything else. He really did nothing except evacuate the army from Persia and give up strategic provinces to the Shah, Shapur II. Ammianus Marcellinus, the uh, historian, the pagan author who was devoted to Julian and Julian's policies, continued to write his history under these Christian rulers, and he makes some very important comments about them. Both of these emperors, he says, were very suspicious of the ruling classes, both Christian and pagan alike. There's a series of dreary treason trials in which officials and officers were removed. Part of this was to get rid of Julian's appointees, but also both of these emperors were very much like many late Roman emperors. They came from a rough and tumble provincial background. They didn't trust the polished elite. Ammianus Marcellinus could be classified as such an individual himself. He spoke excellent Latin. He came from an old Roman colonial family, obviously attended schooling in either the city of Beirut or Antioch, and he himself was very suspect in the eyes of these emperors. In addition, these emperors lacked legitimacy. They tried to get it by fighting under the labarum, that is, that symbol of Constantine, and they tried to cut the image of a Constantine. Valentinian had two sons by different marriages, an older son, Gratian, a younger son, Valentinian II, and Valentinian II was married into the surviving, uh, married to the surviving relative of Constantine, a granddaughter, the only daughter of Constantius II. So there's an effort to, by these Christian emperors to link themselves to the house of Constantine. Another important aspect uh, uh, that's important to consider, um, if you remember that under Julian, all the different Christian confessions were recognized because of Julian's official policy of toleration. Um, and I certainly believe that might have changed if he had won a victory in Persia. Uh, he could have well had in mind an edict of uh, persecution that he would have issued, but that never took place. But as a result, there was a series of litigations usually lawsuits initiated by the Nicene Orthodox bishops, um, that is, those bishops who subscribed to the Council of Nicaea in 325, and then, um, which, which declared the Trinity and the three persons of the Trinity to be co-equal and co-eternal, against the Arian position that had lost. And as I noted, the Arian position had gained favor in the later days of Constantine's reign. Um, in fact, con uh, uh, Constantius, uh, his own son, was a devoted Arian. Um, so the result was that there was this division uh, within the Christian body. Um, there were Arianizing bishops who were still part of the church, uh, but they held Arianizing positions. In fact, Constantine himself was actually baptized by one such bishop on his deathbed. Uh, he was baptized by a bishop named Eusebius, not the famous historian, but another Eusebius who was an Arianizing bishop. Just in the same way now, there are bishops who preach all sorts of ecumenical and otherwise heretical nonsense, but have not been officially deposed, and so there are still lawful bishops of the church. 
Well, the two, these two brothers, Valentinian and Valens, were clearly aware of all this, of this, these divisions. Valentinian, who got the half of the, the western half of the empire, uh, which was really much more difficult in terms of management as a frontier, he was the senior man. He had two sons. Valentin, Valens himself had no children. Valens was the younger brother, a rather colorless figure, and Valentinian was certainly astute enough to realize that he. Um, he needed the support of the Nicene bishops in the Western provinces, particularly the Pope of Rome, and above all of St. Athanasius, the Patriarch of Alexandria, who spent a lot of his time in exile um, uh, because of his position on the Trinity, which you read all about. Uh, Athanasius is one of the great fathers and doctors of the church. He's regarded in that light very strongly, especially in the Orthodox Church. And he was immediately aligned with Valentinian I, and that gave great legitimacy to Valentinian, at least uh, at least vis-a-vis -vis his imperial position. So uh, Valentinian became orthodox. He abandoned his heretical Arian position. Valens, however, remained an ardent Arian, and he faced opposition in Egypt. The communities of the Balkans and Asia Minor were divided. And as a result, he had no united Christian policy, and by default, the pagans were tolerated. It's complicated. In large part, this accounts for why the pagans could carry out the kind of cultural activities that I mentioned in the earlier part of our lecture today, especially the senatorial aristocracy in Rome, why so many of the lesser cities across the Roman Empire still presented very much a pagan face in worship and in public images is because, you know, with cult statues and inscriptions and all of that kind of stuff, uh, because there was just simply too much, uh, too many problems, even with dealing with the divided Christians, uh, that they couldn't, he couldn't present a united front uh, against paganism. The Christianization of Rome at this point was still very uneven. The big cities, the cities with imperial patronage, Caesarea and Cappadocia, uh, home to the Cappadocians, as we've talked about, um, St. Basil, St. Gregory, the theologian, St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, these were obviously all entirely Christian uh, and Orthodox. Uh, these fathers were powerful intellects who had codified theology to counter the Arians. So Caesarea went really Christian. Constantinople, of course, very, very, you know, 100% Christian. Uh, Antioch, essentially the same thing, totally Christian. Rome, on the other hand, was largely in the hands of the pagans, even though there was, of course, the Pope of Rome um, uh, and the Vatican and an you know, unbroken succession of, of bishops going back to apostolic times. Um, nevertheless, uh, it was still very much pagan. And from a, uh, there was a very large pagan presence there and very, very prominent pagan presence. Athens was totally pagan as well. Athens with its schools of philosophy and its intellectual traditions going back you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, still very staunchly pagan. Alexandria was, as I said, very split until the incident uh, that I described in 391, 392. Um, and uh, in Milan and at Trier, uh, they would have been more Christian, but the lesser cities of Gaul and northern Italy, Britain, many of the cities of Spain were still largely pagan. So the Christianization of the Roman Empire is very uneven at this point. And this second Christian dynasty of Valentinian and Valens was very in a very tentative place, as I keep saying. They knew from the start that their position rested on the loyalty of the army. And part of that army, especially in the West, was still very pagan. They had only the most tenuous of links to the family of Constantine, which is essentially, uh, uh, which essentially points to the fact that they were Christians of one of Valentinian's sons who had married the granddaughter of Constantine, and that was their only real connection there. Valentinian proved, though, to be an extremely able emperor. He won victories on the northern frontier, and he, uh, but he died suddenly in the year 375 and left his two rather young sons in control of the Western Empire. One of them was Gratian, the other one was Valentinian II. Now, Gratian, the older of these two, ruled over essentially the Rhine frontier, Gaul and Britain. That is the more difficult frontiers. The younger son, Valentinian II, son uh, uh, by the second marriage of Valentinian I, 
ruled from Milan. And there, he was under the strong influence of Bishop Ambrose, one of the greatest fathers of the Latin church. And uh, this, of course, is the same St. Ambrose of Milan, who would be the patron of St. Augustine, and he exercised a very powerful control over this young emperor. If we have time later on today, I'm going to conclude with a kind of full sort of talk about St. Saint Ambrose. These two brothers didn't get along, Gratian and Valentinian II. They didn't play well together, as it were, uh, but they did agree on one point. They should at least make an effort to appear like Christian rulers. After all, they were Nicene Orthodox emperors. They're, they were heirs to the Constantinian tradition. They tentatively, therefore, began to pass legislation, particularly Gratian, it seems to be, have been behind this, to cut back on some of the toleration, which really had been more of a question of just pragmatism, but which had existed since the death of Julian in 363. Uh, Gratian, for instance, passed certain laws that imposed liabilities on pagan priests. There's a particularly unpopular uh, law that put liabilities on the Vestal Virgins, which was still this kind of sacred, you know, putatively sacred college of priestesses in the city of Rome. The two brothers also agreed, and again, I mentioned this in connection with the senatorial aristocracy in Rome, particularly that famous figure, Symmachus. The two brothers agreed that the altar of victory, which used to be in the Curia or the Senate House of Rome, and then had been removed, uh, and then had been put back by Julian, now should be removed again. It had been originally removed by Constantius II, then put back by Julian, and now Gratian thought it should be removed again. Now, this altar, remember, had gone back to the time of Augustus. It was where it was put there at the, after the Battle of Actium, celebrating his victory over um, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. And the altar of victory was used by the Senate every single time they would hold a meeting, they would offer prayer, you know, sacrifices on it. Uh, and, uh, and it kind of helped, you know, it was an ancient tradition at this point. So Gratians thought it should be removed because it was such an obviously pagan thing. And this was ordered to be done in an imperial edict in 382. The altar was dutifully uh, carried away, put in deep storage for the second time now. It wasn't destroyed or smashed, um, uh, but it was put away. And that's an important symbolic message by both Gratian and Valentinian II, who actually never even went to the city of Rome. Um, no emperor, actually, at this time was in the city of Rome. Between 357 and 394, uh, the city of Rome was, uh, was now going to have to get with the program and start becoming more and more of a Christian city. Well, this was a particularly offensive act to the Roman senators. It resulted, as I intimated earlier, in a series of letters that are known as relationes that were penned by Symmachus, the leading pagan senator of Rome, requesting that the altar be restored. He wrote a series of these letters in 382 and then again in 383. His final one was in 391 to the emperor Theodosius I, and that went absolutely nowhere. But in these earlier ones, and even in that one, he made the arguments for toleration and for the uh, restoration of this altar. He said one of his big points is that it's inappropriate, it's not decorous, not proper to the most maiorum, to the ancestral customs, that term we've talked about before that was so potent in the Roman political vocabulary, that this monument, which goes back to the Republic and which was conceived as celebrating you know, all of the victories that the Romans had ever achieved in their whole history, uh, that this should be removed. And so as a result, he wrote the series of such of these letters trying to stress that this was a monument closely linked to the entire history of Rome. Uh, and it really should be seen that way, even by Christian rulers. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these relationes. Because he wrote these letters to... Um, to the emperor Gratian. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the, the knowledge of this fact came to the attention of Ambrose of Milan. When pagan uh, senators tried to approach the emperor Gratian about its restoration to the Senate House in 382, their delegation was prevented from presenting its request to the emperor due to the intervention of St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan. But then Gratian died in 383. 
and they decided to try again by approaching the emperor now responsible for the western half of the empire valentinian the second then aged only 13 okay so imagine yourself as being a 13 year old and you have this most important senator the praetorian prefect of rome writing you this letter this is the occasion for Symmachus's memorandum relatio three which owes its bureaucratic title to the fact that Symmachus was then prefect of Rome, basically means like mayor of the, of the city, in which capacity he submitted a whole series of memoranda to the emperor on, on a variety of matters. Let's just read what he says. This is just excerpts. The whole thing would be way too long to read together. We demand then the restoration of that condition of religious affairs, which was so long advantageous to the state. Let the rulers of each sect and of each opinion be counted up. A late one practiced the ceremonies of his ancestors, a later did not put them away. If the religion of old times does not make a precedent, let the connivance of the last do so. In other words, there was a Christian emperor who allowed this thing to stay there. Why not let that be a precedent? Who is so friendly with the barbarians as not to require an altar of victory? Who We will be careful henceforth and avoid a show of such things, but at least let that honor be paid to the name which is refused to the goddess. In other words, if you're not going to worship victory as a goddess, then at least venerate the name and the concept of victory. Your fame, which will last forever, owes much and will owe still more to victory. Let those be averse to this power whom it has never benefited. Do you refuse to desert a patronage which is friendly to your triumphs? That power is wished for by all. Let no one deny that which he acknowledges is to be desired should also be venerated. In other words, we all want victory. Why not also worship it? But even if the avoidance of such an omen were not sufficient, it would at least have been seemly to abstain from injuring the ornaments of the Senate House. Allow us, we beseech you, as old men, to leave to posterity what we received as boys. The love of custom is great. And of course, the word for custom would be mores, like as in mos maiorum. Justly did the act of the divine Constantius last but for a short time. All precedents ought to be avoided by you, which you know were soon abolished. We are anxious for the permanence of your glory and your name, that the time to come may find nothing which needs correction. This, of course, would be like the modern day liberal uh, thing that we hear so much of that such and such, whoever they're disagreeing with, they're going to be on the wrong side of history. Where shall we swear to obey your laws and commands? By what religious sanction shall the false mind be terrified so as not to lie and bear in witness? In other words, how are we going to swear our oaths without this thing? All things are indeed filled with God and no place is safe for the perjured but to be urged in the very presence of religious forms has great power in producing a fear of sinning. That altar preserves the concord of all. That altar appeals to the good faith of each. And nothing gives more authority to our decrees than that the whole of our order issues every decree, as it were, under the sanction of our oath. So that a place will be open to perjury, and this will be determined by my illustrious princes, whose honor is defended by a public oath. But the divine Constantius is said to have done the same. Remember, he was the one who removed this altar originally. Let us rather <clears throat> imitate the other actions of that prince who would have undertaken nothing of the kind. If anyone else had committed such an error before him, for the full fall of the earlier sets his successor right, an amendment results from the censure of a previous example, it was pardonable for your grace's ancestor in so novel a matter to fail in guarding against blame. In other words, okay, Constantius had an excuse. Christianity was kind of new in terms of having a Christian emperor. Can the same excuse avail us if we imitate what we know to have been disapproved? Will your majesties listen to other actions of this same prince, which you may more worthily imitate? He diminished none of the, princes, the privileges of the sacred virgins. Those would be the vestals. He filled the priestly offices with nobles. He did not refuse the cost of the Roman ceremonies. And following the rejoicing senate through all the streets of the eternal city, he contentedly beheld the shrines with unmoved countenance. He read the names of the gods inscribed on the pediments. He inquired about the origin of the temples and expressed admiration for their builders. 
Although he himself followed another religion, he maintained its own for the empire. For everyone has his own customs, everyone his own right. Now, this is what, pay attention to this next group of arguments. They're very sophistic and very in harmony with what, the sort of thing that you hear from uh, ecumenical you know, bishops, ecumenistic bishops, and even from your average unredeemed theology professor. The divine mind has distributed different guardians and different cults to different cities. As souls are separately given to infants as they are born, so to peoples the genius of their destiny. Here comes in the proof from advantage, which most of all vouches to man for the gods. For since our reason is wholly clouded, whence does the knowledge of the gods more rightly come to us than from the memory and evidence of prosperity? Now, if a long period gives authority to religious customs, we ought to keep faith with so many centuries and to follow our ancestors as they happily followed theirs. Now, let us suppose that Rome is present and addresses you in these words. Excellent princes, father of your country, respect my years to which pious rites have brought me. Let me use the ancestral ceremonies, for I do not repent of them. Let me live after my own fashion, for I am free. This worship subdue, subdued the world to my laws. These sacred rites repelled Hannibal from the walls and the Senones from the capital. These were the Gauls. Have I been reserved for these? Have I been reserved for, the, for this, that in my old age I should be blamed? I will consider what it is thought should be set in order, but tardy and discreditable is the reformation of old age. We ask then for peace for the gods of our fathers and of our country. It is just that all it is just that all worship should be considered as one. Now th this is what I was what I was referring to when I said like the ecumenistic kind of argument. We look on the same stars, the sky is common, the same world surrounds us. What difference does it make by what pains each seeks the truth? We cannot attain to so great a secret by one road, but this discussion is rather for persons at ease. We offer now prayers, not conflict. Literally, just like a couple of weeks ago, the um, totally ecumenistic Greek Orthodox Bishop of North America, El Pitophorus, said something j just like that. Uh, this completely disgraceful statement that uh, you know, you know, everybody's got their own, you know, their own take on religion. We're all going to the same path. There are many paths up to the same mountain. Well, let us listen to the true voice of Orthodox theology. When St. Ambrose's court contacts alerted him, the saint, to the general import of Symmachus's memorandum, he promptly wrote to the emperor presenting general arguments against acceding to Symmachus's request. This is going to be a hallmark of this staunch defender of the faith, this wonderful saint of Christ, St. Ambrose of Milan. Um, and asking that he be sent a copy of the memorandum typo so that he could respond to Symmachus's arguments point by point, he wrote the following. He wrote two letters. We're going to read them both. Part, again, parts of them, not the whole thing. Since then, most Christian emperor, there is due from you to the true God, both faith and zeal, care and devotion for the faith. I wonder how the hope has risen up to some that you would feel it a duty to restore by your command altars to the gods of the heathen and furnish the funds requisite for profane sacrifices. For whatsoever has long been claimed by either the imperial or the city treasury, you will seem to give rather from your own funds than to be restoring what is theirs. And they are complaining of their losses who never spared our blood who destroyed the very buildings of the churches, and they petition you to grant them privileges, who by the last Julian law denied us the common right of speaking and teaching, and those privileges whereby Christians also have often been deceived. For by those privileges they endeavored to ensnare some, partly through inadvertence, partly in order to escape the burden of public requirements. And because all are not found to be brave, even under Christian princes, many have lapsed. You know what that means, offered sacrifice, fallen away from the faith. But this cannot be decreed without sacrilege. Wherefore, I implore you not to decree or order it, nor to subscribe to any decrees of that sort. I, as a priest of Christ, call upon your faith, 
all of us bishops would have enjoined, would have joined in calling upon you, were not the report so sudden and incredible that any such thing had been either suggested in your council or petitioned for by the Senate. Be far, but far be it from the Senate to have petitioned this. A few heathen are making use of a common name. In other words, not all of the senators were pagans. That's what he's saying here. There were Christians in the body of the Senate. For nearly two years ago, when the same attempt was being made, Holy Demasis, Bishop of the Roman Church, elected by the judgment of God, sent to me a memorial, which the Christian senators in great numbers put forth. A memorial must mean memorandum, like a letter, protesting that they had given no such authority, that they had not agreed with such requests of the heathen, nor given consent to them, and they declared publicly and privately that they would not come to the Senate if any such thing were decreed. It is agreeable to the dignity of your, that is, the Christian times, that Christian senators should be deprived of their dignity. I'm sorry, this is a question. Is it agreeable to the dignity of your, that is, Christian times, that Christian senators should be deprived of their dignity? in order that effect should be given to the profane will of the heathen. This memorandum I sent to your clemency's brother, and from it it was plain that the Senate had made no order about the expenses of superstition. If it were a civil cause, the right of reply would be reserved for the opposing party. It is a religious cause, and I, the bishop, make a claim. Let a copy of the memorandum, which has been sent be given me that I may answer more fully and then let your clemency's father be consulted on the whole subject and vouchsafe an answer. Certainly, if anything else is decreed, we bishops cannot contentedly suffer it and take no notice. You indeed may come to the church, but will find either no priest there or one who will resist you. In other words, if you do this, you're going to be excommunicated. Okay, notice what a, what a different world we're in right now. Uh, in in previous times, in, in classical times, there was nobody who could ever talk like this to an emperor. There was nobody who could talk to Augustus and tell him, look, man, if you do this thing, you're wrong, and you're going to be punished for it. You're going to go to hell. I'm going to make sure you're excommunicated. Um, nobody had the guts. Nobody had the moral power uh, to speak to any autocrat like that. But now that the church um is so prominent uh and now that the emperors are christians the church balances out it can even actually uh radically uh cut down the auto autocratic and and absolutist claims of the state the most wonderful example of this really and it's also involving san ambrose of Milan. i'm going to talk about it later on if i still have the energy it was uh, at a later time when Theodosius I had um, very violently put down a series of riots that took place in the city of Thessalonica in northern Greece. And by doing so, he kind of, you know, Roman emperor, he went in there very autocratically, and just called in the troops and killed a whole bunch of people, thousands of people, and uh, didn't really think anything about it. He had put down the riot. It would have been par for the course in classical times. But he was a Christian. Okay, He was a baptized Christian. And so St. Ambrose of Milan, Milan uh, refused him entrance into church when he came to church and and excommunicated him and said, you are outside of the communion of the church. If you die in this state, you are absolutely damned for all of eternity and you need to repent. And remarkably, this very intrepid, very um, strong-willed emperor, Theodosius, took it with humility and he performed great acts of repentance, of penitence and um and ultimately after a period of time was reintegrated and the the uh excommunication was lifted off of him and uh and he was reintegrated into the life of the of the, of the church um and was able to receive communion again this is what a bishop is supposed to do okay this is what um uh speaking truth to power actually looks like it is a very pathetic thing that in our day and age the bishops are so craven oftentimes, not all the time, but are so cowardly in the face of, you know, um, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. When you have people, politicians, acting in 
ways that are so completely at variance with church practice and doctrine, and yet, uh, and the bishops basically do nothing to uh, to call them out on that. That is, there's no excuse for that. Okay, there's just no excuse. It's a total disgrace. Um, and uh, and it stands in complete contradiction to the whole patristic tradition, the whole history of the church. Now, um, this is and this is what Saint Ambrose is warning the young Valentinian II about. What will you answer a priest who says to you, the church does not seek your gifts, but you have adorned the heathen temples with gifts. The altar of Christ rejects your gifts because you have made an altar for, for, for idols. For the voice is yours, the hand is yours, the subscription is yours, the deed is yours. The Lord Jesus refuses and rejects your service because you have served idols. For he said to you, you cannot serve two masters, the virgins consecrated to God have no privileges from you, and do the vestal virgins claim them? Why do you ask for the priests of God to whom you have preferred the profane petitions of the heathen? We cannot take up a share of the errors of others. In other words, there is a big difference when you, acting as an emperor, give state monies to support an altar of paganism, and you just can't do that. What will you answer to these words, that you have fallen, are that you who have fallen are but a boy every age is perfect in christ every age is full of god no childhood is allowed in faith for even children have confessed christ against their persecutors with fearless mouth wherefore o emperor since you see that if you decree anything of that kind injury will be done first to god and then to your father and brother i implore you to do that which you know will be profitable for your salvation before God. Now, so that was his first letter, before he even got to see the points that Symmachus makes. Then, having received a copy of Symmachus's memorandum, St. Ambrose responded with letter 18, which we will now again read small excerpts from. The illustrious prefect of the city has in his memor memorandum set forth three propositions, which he considers of force. That Rome, as he says, asks for her rights again, that pay be given for her, to her priests and vestal virgins, and that a general famine followed upon the refusal of the priests' stipends. In this first proposition, Rome complains with sad and tearful words, asking, as he says, for the restoration of the rights of her ancient ceremonies. These sacred rights, he says, repulsed Hannibal from the walls and the Senones from the capital. And so at the same time, what the power of the sacred rites is proclaimed, I'm sorry, and so at the same time that the power of the sacred rites is proclaimed, their weakness is betrayed. So that Hannibal long insulted the Roman rites, and while the gods were fighting against him, he arrived a conqueror at the very walls of the city. Why did they suffer themselves to be besieged for whom their gods were fighting in arms? This is going to be one of the, it's very similar in some ways to um, kind of in, in sort of micro uh, microcosm uh, to some of the arguments St. Augustine will use in the city of God. And why should I say anything of the Signones, whose entrance into the inmost capital, the remnant of the uh, Romans, could not have prevented, had not a goose by its frightened cackling betrayed them? So, okay, I need to explain what's going on here. In 390 BC, before Rome was really powerful, the Gauls, the you know northern Celts uh, of Europe, invaded Italy and made a beeline for Rome and sacked the city of Rome. And the Romans were making their one great last stand on the Capitoline Hill. When in the middle in the early dawn, um, a bunch of Gauls were sneaking up the other side of the hill where, that was not being protected. And it would have meant certain death for everybody on the hill, except that a bunch of geese saw them and started cackling with that you know, characteristic shrill goose sound. And that woke up the Romans and then enabled them to defend themselves. Um, and so ever after that, the Romans actually had a special holiday for the sacred geese, where they would carry them around on fine embroidered pillows and, you know, offer them ceremonial meal cakes and have all sorts of prayers and, you know, incense and sacrifices and so on in honor of the sacred geese. Okay, so uh, what I love about these church fathers from this time is that they have an almost kind of like 
like almost like new atheistic kind of like flippancy when it comes to making fun of the religious practices of the pagans. Like, you know, they they, um, they find this stuff to be totally ridiculous, which of course it is. Um, and so this is a good example of that. Like, so they're saying like, you know, St. Ambrose is basically saying, Symmachus, you're telling me that the gods pr protected Rome be, uh, in the times of, of, of the Sinones, the, the Gauls who attacked in 390s, it was the geese who actually, and it wasn't even the gods, see what sort of protectors the Roman temples have. Where was Jupiter at that time? Was he speaking in the goose? But why should I deny that their sacred rites fought for the Romans? For Hannibal also worshipped the same gods. Good point. Let them choose then, which they will. If these sacred rites conquered in the Romans, then they were overcome in the Carthaginians. If they triumphed in the Carthaginians, they certainly did not benefit the Romans. Let then that in invidious complaint to the Roman people come to an end. Rome has given no such charge. She speaks with other words. Why do you daily stain me with the useless blood of the harmless herd? Trophies of victory depend not on the entrails of the flocks, but on the strength of those who fight. I subdued the world by a different discipline. He's speaking in the person of Rome, kind of throwing Symmachus's rhetoric back onto him. St. Ambrose was equally educated uh, with Symmachus. He, in fact, he was one of the last Latins to be thoroughly educated in both Greek and Latin. That really was coming to an end by his time. Camillus, famous Roman of the good old days, was my soldier who slew those who had taken the Tarpian rock and brought back the standards taken from the capital. Valor laid those low whom religion had not driven off. What shall I say of Attilius Regulus, who gave the service of his death? Regulus is another great hero of Roman good old days. Uh, wonderful story i can't uh, resist telling you the story so he was fighting the carthaginians in the first punic war regulus and uh he actually led the force invading north africa but was defeated and so the the carthaginians said to him go back to rome and convince them to leave us alone to stop the war so he went back and he, had, he gave them a solemn oath that he would if he weren't able to convince them to end the war he would um return and come back and, and no doubt face terrible punishment. Um, and he went there and then immediately told the Romans, whatever you do, do not stop fighting the Carthaginians. You have to keep on pushing the war to, to, to victory. And then he went back. And of course, there's this wonderful scene of, of all of his friends and family saying, no, no, don't leave. And he said, no, I swore an oath to the gods. I have to honor it. And he went back and died in the most horrible fashion where he was placed inside of basically like a coffin, a standing coffin. And, and all throughout the inside of the coffin had been nails hammered in from the outside so that he couldn't rest himself on any one place inside of the coffin without being poked by these horrible nails. And he died basically by being uh, deprived of sleep. Okay, mortuus es non dormiendo as Cicero says in retelling of the story. So this is the kind of person who showed great Roman virtue, and yet the gods basically allowed to have that happen to him. That's what St. Ambrose is getting at. And actually, St. Augustine will use this precise same example for the same point in the City of God. Africanus, this is the defeater of Hannibal in 202, Scipio Africanus. Africanus found his triumphs not among the altars of the capital, but among the lines of Hannibal. Why do you bring forward the rights of our ancestors? I hate the rights of Nero's. Why should I speak of the emperors of two months and the ends of rulers close, closely joined to their commencements? Or is it perchance a new thing for the barbarians to cross their boundaries? Were they two Christians in whose wretched and unprecedented cases, the one a captive emperor and under the other the captive world made manifest that their rights, which promised victory, were false? Was there then no altar of victory? I mourn over my downfall. My old age is tinged with that shameful bloodshed. I do not blush to be converted with the whole world in my old age. It is undoubtedly true that no age is too late to learn. Let that old age blush which cannot amend itself. Not the old age of years is worthy of praise, but that of character. There is no shame in passing to better things. This alone was common to me with the barbarians, that of old I knew not God. Your sacrifice is a rite of being sprinkled with the blood of beasts. Why do you seek the voice of God and dead animals? Come and learn on earth the heavenly warfare. We live here, but our warfare is there. 
Let God himself who made me teach me the mystery of heaven, not man who knew not himself, whom rather than God should I believe concerning God. How can I believe you who confess that you know not what you worship? Now, this is the ecumenical uh, argument that he takes down. By one road, says he, one cannot attain to so great a secret. What you know not, that we know by the voice of God. You see, this is one of the great sophistries that one hears from humanists, secularists, ecumenists, is that they say it's proud to say that one faith has all the answers. It's proud, uh, you know, and arrogant, it's hubristic to say that, you know, we're right and everyone else is wrong. But the whole nature of truth, my dear friends, is that way. Is it proud and arrogant to say two plus two equals four? Is it, would it not be the height of folly to say that, well, I have to be open-minded to the idea that two plus two equals five? Uh, there is real truth. And yes, the nature of truth is such that if one thing is true, its opposite cannot also be true. Your ways, therefore, do not agree with ours. You implore peace for your gods from the emperors. We ask for peace for the emperors themselves from Christ. You worship the work of your own hands. We think it an offense that anything which can be made should be an esteemed God. God wills not that he should be worshipped in stones. And in fine, your philosophers themselves have ridiculed these things. That is a, a point that if we had more time, I would go further with. But one of the themes, this is something I mentioned, uh, basis of an article I have coming out in October. One of the themes of Christian apologetics, really from the third and then definitely into the fourth century, um, is that a lot of Christian church fathers take over arguments from the philosophers themselves, because many Stoic philosophers, even Epicurean philosophers, um, argued against the worship of the traditional gods. And many church fathers take over these arguments and use them, but now in the service of Christianity. And this kind of sentiment, you know, etiam philosophi ipsi uh, ista reserunt, even the philosophers themselves have laughed at these things. Um, that kind of spells out that principle right there. Okay, well. Ultimately, St. Uh, Ambrose prevailed over Valentinian II, and the altar was never brought back into the Senate House. Let's pick up, though, with the kind of general theme that we've been going on of this movement towards Theodosius I, because that's really where we're, we're going to be headed now. The Western Army didn't take so well to the fact that uh, uh, um, that all of these changes were going on inside of Roman politics, inside of the Roman army. Uh, the, Roman, the army in Britain, the army on the Rhine, many of the soldiers were not Roman citizens, but were what were known as federates. And in the 350s and 360s, increasingly the emperors had shifted over to recruiting barbarian tribal regiments known as these federates. They were usually Germanic peoples, Sometimes they were also Iranian peoples, such as the Alans or the Sarmatians, but these people, if they were Christian, were only Christian in name. Many of them were still pagan, and large numbers of the Western army were still pagan, and the laws that were, in, uh, that were now being uh, imposed, imposing civil liabilities on pagan priests, uh, were seen as interfering with the sacrifices. This all sparked another rebellion in the Western army. Uh, it was a rebellion that was caused for several reasons. The ones I've just mentioned, and also the fact that Gratian was uh, kind of such a feckless ruler. He spent most of his time hunting and drinking in Trier, and he never actually led the army. And so in the year 383, the army in Britain rose in rebellion, and they declared their commander Magnus Maximus, which is a great name in Latin, because if you know Latin, it means uh, good or great the greatest, basically, is what that means. So obviously, we're coming from a guy who's really feeling very insecure about his humble origins, that he would give himself a name like the great, the greatest. <clears throat> it's like beyond Trumpian. Um, well, anyway, this man, they declared emperor, and his army invaded Gaul. They were received by the army in the, on the Rhine, and Gratian was deserted. He was caught 
and actually uh, ultimately executed. And at this point, Magnus Maximus thought, well, let's cut a deal with Valentinian II, the surviving brother of Gratian. Um, but, uh, but there was no deal. Uh, Valentinian II basically said there's no point in dealing with this rebellious governor. He's too dangerous. And the result was that Magnus Maximus ultimately invaded Italy and drove Valentinian II and his mother eastwards towards Constantinople. At that point in Constantinople, there was another emperor, Theodosius. He had been elevated to the throne in 379, and he was the son of a famous count and namesake, Count Theodosius, one of the great generals of Spanish origin who had fought in the earlier fourth century. And Theodosius had been married into the imperial family and had been commissioned to take charge of the Roman army in the east after the disaster of the Battle of Adrianople. Now, we saw the movie about this. The Battle of Adrianople is well known. Um, uh, it is a famous battle where the Goths uh, now killed the Emperor Valens, the Aryan Emperor. Uh, and this went uh, a long way, actually, in discrediting the Aryan position and nailed most of the Eastern army, which included a lot of Aryan officers, now to the Orthodox faith. That defeat in 378 uh, had posed a crisis. There was no imperial figure in the East at that time, therefore after Valens' death, no one to represent the imperial family. The Goths were running amok all over the Balkans. Theodosius was therefore brought in to take charge of the East. He was brought in by Gratian and Valentinian II, and he did an excellent job. He did so primarily by recruiting the Goths into the army, by working out terms with them and establishing his position in Constantinople. We're going to see this uh, in our next lecture, but um, basically uh, Alaric and all those other Goths, those children of Adrianople, many of them went on to become good Romans and actually fought for the Roman army for the next couple of decades. Another important point about Theodosius is that he was a devoted Nicene Orthodox Christian. He was a tough general. He commanded the respect of the various German federate regiments, which is extremely important. And there was no question of his religious loyalties. When the imperial family fled from Milan to Constantinople, Theodosius immediately mounted an attack against Magnus Maximus. And in 388, somewhere on the Sava River, which is in Serbia, a tributary of the Danube, of course, such a strategic frontier for the Roman world, Theodosius and his army defeated the Western army uh, that was being led by Magnus Maximus. Maximus himself was killed and order was restored in the Roman West. It looked as if everything was hunky dory then at that point. We have Nicene rulers in both Milan and Constantinople. Rome had again more requests to restore the altar, but those were just turned down de rigueur. It looked as if this uneasy alliance, this uneasy toleration between Christian and pagans was going to come to a quick end. Now, Theodosius gave good indications of this. He had outlawed the Manichees. Um, the Manichees that we've talked about before, and he initiated a new wave of persecution against the Manichees, actually. The last persecution against the Manichees had been uh, initiated by Diocletian. Um, now Theodosius in the 380s didn't move directly against the cults in law, but he turned a blind eye to his administrators, particularly a certain fellow named Maternus, who was the prefect of the Roman East. Remember that whole speech that I read you by, uh, you know, by Libanius, um, where um, in this, this big speech, De Templis, on the temples, where Libanius gives a whole speech talking, you know, saying that, look, you allowed this guy Maternus to go around and ransack our temples and stuff. And so uh, Theodosius, I would say, kind of turned a blind eye to those sort of things. Uh, just as he would ultimately turn a blind eye kind of to the, all the stuff that was going on in, in Alexandria in 392. Now, Theodosius, as I said, didn't pay any attention to this, and he was steadily moving towards a position that 
that once he had secured Constantinople and had secured the loyalty of the army of the East, he was going to move against the gods in a way that the emperor Constantine had never really dared to do. He couldn't really have done. Things were just way too, there, you know, the Christian position, the Christianization of the Roman Empire had been, you know, only really begun at that time. So Theodosius is in a, is in a much firmer position to do this. And he could do this for several reasons. One was his success as a general. Two, you remember that in 381, he had summoned the Second Ecumenical Council held at Constantinople, the imperial capital, and presided over it just as Constantine had presided over the first. And it reinstated all of the canons of the Council of Nicaea, as well as declared Constantinople uh, the new Rome, and basically the second Rome. The language in Canon 2, which is the second chapter of the Proceedings for the Second Ecumenical Council, um, basically uh, enumerates all of the five ancient apostolic sees, Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. The patriarch in Constantinople basically says he has the same rank, therefore, as all the rest of them. And that was, that was always the way that the ancient church viewed itself. There was never one place that was the top, okay? Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, uh, Jerusalem, um, and Antioch. Those were all the, the, you know, the original five major seas. This would also, of course, lead, uh, this would cause a problem later on in 1054 between the Eastern and Western churches. Nonetheless, what the Second Ecumenical Council uh, did was it ended Arianism as an issue. Some of the Germanic peoples, the East Germanic peoples converted by Constantius II, had remained Aryan Christians, notably the Goths, the Vandals, and uh, the Goths at, this, uh, at a later point would split into two groups, the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths. Uh, but all of that disunity that had so vexed the imperial-sponsored church was now gone. Constantinople was now definitely the Orthodox capital of the Roman East, and that meant that Theodosius was in a position now first to allow his administrators and who, whatever other Christian mobs to attack pagan sanctuaries, and secondly, to turn down appeals by pagans like Symmachus, um, uh, who wanted you know, special favors. And then ultimately, in the year 391 and 392, he issued a series of laws, three laws in particular, the last of which was issued in 392. And these laws banned public sacrifice throughout the Roman world and declared that officially from now on, the only religion in the Roman Empire was, with any legitimacy, was Nicene Orthodox Christianity. So this indeed, my friends, is the kind of ultimate big turning point. I'm going to read you right now. Uh, the one of those laws as it came out okay in 391 this law that was issued by Theodosius to officials in Rome which represents a com comprehensive ban on pagan sacrifice the emperors Valentinian II Theodosius I and Arcadius Augusti to Albinus Praetorian prefect no one is to stain themselves with sacrifice no one is to slaughter harmless sacrificial animals no one is to enter shrines. No one is to undertake the ritual purification of temples or worship images crafted by human hand. Otherwise, they will be liable to divine and human penalties. This ruling also applies to magistrates. If any of them is an adherent of pagan rituals and enters a temple anywhere to worship, whether while traveling or in the city, they will be immediately required to pay 15 pounds of gold and their staff will pay the same amount with comparable speed unless they have acted against the magistrate and reported him without delay in a formal deposition. Consular governors and their staff are to pay six pounds, special commissioners and other governors four pounds, and their staff the same amount in equal shares. Issued on the sixth day before the calends of March at Milan, that would be February 24th, in the consulates of Tatian and Symmachus, that same Symmachus that we've been talking so much about. Think about how the situation now has changed so dramatically in the 350 years from when we uh, really began. That is, you know, really the 350 years, I guess, let's say from, you know, the time of uh, 
Nero's persecutions, or or take, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the crucifixion, which is kind of where we began things. Um, the definition of what is a, of what a Roman is is going to be based now on religious affiliation. This is going to affect all the pagans. It will eventually affect all the Jews too, as well, because they aren't within the Christian community. Whereas under pagan emperors, Jews could have Roman citizenship. It was, it was a matter of legal definition, not of religious uh, um, adherence. Of course, it will also affect heretics, those Christians who, d- who did not um, accept the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. These laws carried major implications, therefore, and everybody knew it as soon as they were promulgated and publicly announced in the cities of the Roman world. There was, of course, inevitably a reaction. One of those reactions was in Alexandria, I mentioned this earlier, where the Serapium was stormed and pagans were essentially discredited. There was also a reaction in the West. And, um, you know, where else is it going to happen? It's going to happen in the Western army because that was still such a strong bastion of paganism. At the time of the promulgation of these laws in 391, 392, there was a Frankish general named Arbogast he held a position known as Magister Militum, which is best translated as, well, literally master of the soldiers, but it was something like a generalissimo. Arbogast was the first of a series of barbarian or provincial generals who held the supreme military command, especially of the Western fuel armies, because emperors increasingly were absorbed in ceremonial roles in their capitals. Arbogast seems to have been behind the murder of Valentinian II, the second and youngest son of the Emperor Valentinian I. Valentinian was murdered under mysterious circumstances in 392, and a grammarian named Eugenius, uh, the name Eugene in English, was proclaimed emperor by the Western Army of the Rhine. Okay, This is the last big attempt of the pagans to try to assert themselves over against the Christian emperors. And there are several issues involved in this rebellion. It isn't all strictly religious, but Eugenius, while technically a Christian, actually, openly tolerated the sacrifices to the gods. Arbogast was a Frankish general. If he was a Christian, it was certainly of a more nominal sort. Many of his German soldiers who were Franks and Alemanni, the two principal tribes recruited in the Western Army, definitely were pagan. And so now Theodos, but he was being backed, though, by this, the pagan stronghold in the Senate of Rome. This is an important point. Theodosius I now faced a second Western army, the fourth in the fourth century, which had been propelled by pagan soldiers, backed by the pagan Senate, objecting to his Christian policies. The first was, of course, Magnentius, who we talked about before. The second was Julian. Now the third, Mag- Magnus Maximus. And if you can follow all of these crazy names, Arbogast and, uh, and his puppet emperor, Eugenius. For the first time, then, the Roman senators finally react. They finally do more than just write letters and orations. They're outraged over the laws of 391 and 392, and they proclaim their loyalty to the Western usurper. Theodosius marches from the east to the west again and confronts this mixed army of rebels, and a major battle is fought with the help of those Goths that have now been absorbed into the Roman army after Adrianople. A major battle is fought on, fought on September 5th, 6th, 394 at the Frigidus River. The Battle of the Frigidus. It's a river just north of the city of Rome. Oh, I'm sorry, of Apuleia, which is the ancient precursor to Venice. So that's Apuleia right there. And so the Frigidus would be right up over here. It's a strategic city, but that's not the point. On the first day of the battle, Theodosius' army gets a rough showing of it. It's mostly Goths, actually, who get killed. You'll learn about that next time. Uh, so from the Roman perspective, that's not too bad. It's just, it's just people who you didn't really want to ha- having around anyway that got wiped out. 
On the second day, a hailstorm emerges and blows the hail into the eyes of the rebels, and Theodosius wins an immense victory. Eugenius is captured and executed. Arbogast commits suicide, and the Roman senators are totally humiliated, embarrassed, uh, crestfallen, whatever you like. The Roman senators did not fight. They wrote letters of support, of course, but they weren't expected to fight. They weren't up there taking up arms. They just had publicly thrown their hat into, their, into that ring. But therefore, they were now humiliated, and they surrendered unconditionally. The result, of course, was a second battle victory, a, a second battle miracle for a Christian emperor. The Battle of the Frigidus was hailed by Christians as essentially the second Milvian bridge. Once again, God gave his favor to a Christian emperor, and the, the pagans were cast out. Theodosius entered in triumph and ordered the removal of the altar of victory, and everyone knew that it was going to be a rough day for the pagans. Fortunately for the pagans, Theodosius suddenly died on January 17th, 395, before he could pass any more legislation, and he was succeeded by his two sons, Arcadius and Honorius. And thus begins the rapid collapse, really, of the Western Empire, which ultimately disintegrates in 476 AD and the near loss of the Eastern Empire. Nonetheless, Theodosius' reign was a turning point. From this point on, the Christian monarchy was never again in question. There would be no way the pagans would ever get it again. Henceforth, the pagans had been barred from all public worship, and therefore their faith had now been made for all intents and purposes, illegal. Increasingly, the word pagan, and from this point on, came to denote a barbarian, a peasant. The educated pagans that, um, uh, that we've been looking at throughout this whole time tonight now began to disappear. More and more of them, of course, converted. By the early 5th century, many convert to Christianity, particularly the Roman senators, as I said, by the mid-5th century, really had the majority of them had already come over to Christianity. Above all, Theodosius now defined a Roman citizenship, Roman identity, not by political, uh, civic uh, uh, factors, but by religion. It was not by legal rights, it was by religion. And those who did not follow were subject to the full punishment of Roman law. And the result, really, was that Theodosius had taken the first step to creating the kind of society that came to characterize medieval Europe. 